Present. Here. of all that is happening in the world today, in the midst of situations and circumstances that seem and tend to bombard us, Lord, we ask for your grace and mercy as we talk about our beloved city. We would simply ask that in the midst of all those things, that you might continue to let the sunshine of grace and mercy shine clearly upon us. Be with us as we deliberate. Be with those who might come and give insights and information. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Palin. Our first item on the work session today is our financial report. Ms. Jan Alonzo, Finance Director, will be present to answer questions regarding the February 2018 financial report, if anyone has some. I had one, but I can't remember what it was until I had email. Do you have anything? Yeah, I do. I want to do one thing. I just wanted you all to know that we have finally hired our business license administrator. <laughs> it is, it's she, her name is Lakeisha Shannon. She comes from the city of Marion, where in addition to being the business license administrator, she was also the town clerk. Mm. So she's got lots of experience, mm. and she's ready to get started. So she knows Judge Brogdon. <laughs> <laughs> Beside her is Greg Williams. He's the deputy. He's been here for about six months, um, but... So I think between the two of them, we'll get the things accomplished if you want them. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Look forward to working with you. All right. Item two on the work session today is our water and sewer rate study update. Mr. Robert Chambers, MBA, principal consultant at Black and Beach. Mr. Chambers. Might be in the How are you, Robert? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all again for giving us the opportunity to be here and uh, present and, you know, go through this process uh, with you. Before, before I get going, any questions or anything from your, on your behalf before I get going? So today, as a part of the agenda, we'll discuss the drivers, uh, the look at a few of the assumptions we've utilized as a part of the study. We'll review the financial plan and then look at uh, the utility bill impacts. Based on our, our recommendations or, or proposals, you know, what does that mean to the typical customer? So drivers, uh, we are looking at this uh, from an integrated and a holistic business perspective. This is the financial planning arm, and we're developing an integrated financial plan, but it also has aspects on different parts of your business. You know, how you operate and how you achieve business excellence and ultimately what it means to the customers you serve. So as we go through this process, uh, this is in the forefront of the thought leadership and and everything we do as it relates to planning. So what are your drivers? Increased demand for utility services. You're, you have typical organic growth, and then you also have, you know, significant customers that are coming in with special usage requirements. That has to be considered. Uh, you have a, a, a diverse and informed customer base. So how do we keep your customer base engaged? You know, how do we make sure we understand what they require and serve accordingly? Uh, ultimately, we want to be able to assist in implementing sustainable operating and capital plans. And finally, we also want to make sure that we achieve revenue stability 
and we meet the financial metrics that were you know set about for you as a utility. So we've seen this slide before, and not to go over it, but first of all, I'd like to commend you for having the willingness to take action. Uh, as, we, as I've highlighted in the past, the, the goal here is to not have too many consecutive lumps, meaning a higher increase one year, no increase, is to have a smooth plan uh, to create as least impact for the customers we serve as possible. So we're not going to go over this slide in detail because you've seen it a few times. So coming back to what we did last year and what was presented to you last year. Uh, during last year's presentation, we, we came about presenting a revenue increase for FIO 19, which was forecasted to be about 13%. Okay? Since FYO 19, we had a few edits and adjustments which is natural with regard to how you operate. And we'll be presenting a, a proposed revenue increase, which will be less than this 13%. One of the main things that happened, <laughs> one of the main things that happened, you know, gr growth came in, but not at the rate we originally anticipated. o and and other costs came in just about what we forecasted. And then other revenues, um, Line 11, if you notice last year we forecasted about 7.4. That number is a little higher this year. So the combination of those things uh, creates a new situ situation which we'll present uh, this year. Is the debt ratio coverage at 2.0 because that's a requirement of our bonding or anything? Or could we be at 1.5? We could be at 1.5. Our target for years since I've been here has been 2.0. That is one of the things when we talk with the rating agencies. Um, actually, I'm sorry, Robert probably could answer this too. But as we talk no, to no the rating, I, I get used to you. <laughs> sorry. Anyhow, uh, it is not a requirement. However, what we've done in the past, we've taken a look to see kind of what the averages are for other double A plus, double A one uh, utilities, roughly the same size as ours. So for the last several years, 2.0 is in that range of uh, what others are, and also the amount of cash we keep on hand is 137% yes, sir. Um, of, of O&M. Those two are two targets that we look at whenever Moody's posts the information out there on all the utilities. So we try to stay in that range. Um, if you read our prior uh, rating reports, they seem very comfortable with our cash and with our coverage. Um, doesn't mean we couldn't look to make adjustments to that in the future. That's, I mean, that's traditionally what, that's what we've been targeting. We get a lot of good uh, discussion from the rating agencies by using those two items. And, and Jeff, may I add two things? So in addition to what Jeff highlighted, one of the big things the rating agencies look at with regard to measuring your credit worthiness is what kind of a financial plan do you have in place? How have your metrics done over time? And or do you have the willingness to take action? And they put all those together and come up with a score, which then is a measure of your credit worthiness. You've taken the step to implement internally a 2.0 metric and meet the cash requirement, which then demonstrates the credit worthiness and the rating you currently have. You could look at adjusting it, but if you do, there's going to be questions with regard to why is that new direction taken? Strategically, where you're going, is there a strain? So as much as you can maintain the metrics that you have and maintain the stability that you have, the better it will be as you go forward with regard to your credit worthiness and demonstrating your ability to meet your obligations. Okay. Question? Sure. Uh, in terms of some of the questions that would be asked as to why would we make the change, how, how does the, uh, our progress on... Uh, infrastructure, uh, repairs, infrastructure in terms of our goals of where we need to be, how does that impact okay. that number? So it, it, Looking at progress and, and okay. that sort of thing. It, it impacts the number in a few ways. The first of which, from a financial perspective, it's your ability to actually put your CIP in the ground, mm -hmm. 
execute and implement the CIP you've planned, and then service the debt or the cost, the debt service related with the CIP. And that's demonstrated through your cash position and meeting your debt service coverage. Secondly, the, the agencies also look at how you operate, right? What kind of complaints you have, what's your level of service, and what, how are you reinvesting in your system, and how many breaks and all that stuff as a part of your organizational analysis. And the manner by which you keep renewing and replacing your infrastructure, getting the right infrastructure in the ground at the right time, mm -hmm. you know, to maintain your level of service, it then plays in, in the rating agency saying, you're operating a good business. Uh, we see little risk. There's always risk, but we see little risk, and you can maintain your credit worthiness or get a better score going forward. So in combination, that's how the infrastructure component works. And let me add to that. Periodically throughout the year, Clint Sheely and Joey Jaco come for us, and they'll usually come and, and with uh, some of the people with Clean Water 2020 and other staff members, and they'll talk about the various projects that we're doing and where they're at and how they're moving along and where how they have an effect on the system. So they'll, I say that's at least two times a year. It might be more than that. Yeah, we were going to try to do that. I am waiting for the day that Clint and, and Joey come and talk about revenue instead of spending all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, I've kind I've kind of tried to stay on top of both, but um, it, it it does make sense to uh, show periodically how how we're doing with the with the dollars we've targeted or earmarked certain projects and you know, that's why I'm asking so if, if we're not or, or if we appear not to be reaching our targets then the rating agencies would tend to look at that yes if essentially as a part of the bigger picture how they evaluate the utility it will be demonstrated and shown okay. and, and we will have one that we can schedule more during the year we've had over the last I'd say four to five years Kind of been some years, maybe we've had more. I think uh, the whole team's pretty much ready on almost a quarterly basis um, to bring a presentation. Um, what will happen is typically when we show y'all four or five in a row, five <laughs> quarters, um, then it kind of <coughs> slows, we slow that down because um, y'all will see a lot of the same stuff. But you're right, it, we yeah. haven't had as many. And as we go through this discussion, this will be a good time for us to bring so y'all can see all the, the many projects that are going on. Okay. okay. So to continue, going into our assumptions. <coughs> so starting with revenues, we're starting with FY, uh, FY 2018 revenues at about 137 million. Uh, we're forecasting about a percent growth in, in customers. Is that conservative growth or? It, it is, it is a forecast of growth, and it, it, I wouldn't say it, it, it's conservative, but, you know, conservative is of opinion, if you know what I mean. But we feel that 1% is appropriate. So you, you, what you're saying is, is you know you, we can achieve 1%. My question is, is, what's our stretch growth, and what are we doing to stretch that growth? How much more growth can we achieve? Yes. Okay, so if we take a look at historically what we've done, mm -hmm. we've done maybe just over a percent, a percent, percent and a half in some cases. So that's why we've taken that approach. So it, that's also one of the reasons we do an annual update so we can really capture the growth in just the past year to put it in numbers. I think maybe three or four years ago, we had a higher number in there because I remember I was standing up here talking about it, and I, think, I felt like we had 2% or maybe even 3%. And that ended up being a little too aggressive, um, and so the numbers, the numbers didn't come in the way we wanted. That was just several years ago. So, one percent. If it ends up being greater than that, we'll reflect. It'll all get updated because we do our annual update mm -hmm. the study, and they look at our actual consumption up through just this past December. 
Correct. Could, so how could we have? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Reverend. How um, how frequent is uh, is the update? I understand the one percent being very conservative in the growth of the model. So if we hit two to three, we really we're really stretching. If we hit two to three, that'll actually help the following year. Um, but in addition, if we hit two or three, then we'll look to consider utilizing that going forward. But we also have to look as to what caused it. All right. Yeah. It's because one big user came on and that busted you up to 3%. We probably don't want to use 3% the next year as the future growth. But can, right. can, I guess my follow-up to that is, is should we have somebody who is their sole job is to create water customers? at every home builders meeting and all the things, all the aspects of seeing where the growth is and encouraging it as people are looking, well, yes, we can bring water to that area so that your project can happen. I don't think we have a, a business development person in there. Um, you know, and that goes on to the PR because as we discussed, you know, having that person who is our advocate out there because at the end of the day, we're going to grow. There's, there's not a whole lot of competition for water here. So we need to be actively working with those partners. And some of it may be where we have to make some investment on our side for the growth. But I think we need to kind of reach out there and become more partners so that we can grow our system. One of the things, you know, we've got Ryan over in economic development. But, but um, the, one of the other initiatives we've got is, is trying to put together a split that, that shows where we've got how much capacity we've got in this area to go redevelop mm -hmm. and make that readily available for developers. I think that's a great idea. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We can do a better job in the face of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a double play on that is to go in too is, 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 is Ryan's out there. We need to encourage and this, this involves zoning, planning, economic development is we got to grow in our corridors where we have already got infrastructure and push up you know, mm -hmm. traditionally we we tried to limit people's growth, and we're, from a standpoint of going vertical, and vertical is where we ought to be. That's creating more customers in an area where we already have uh, infrastructure. infrastructure investment. We're not having to reinvent the wheel there, which you know then becomes a net win for us. And looking at the system as we've talked about too, you know, um, I think those are all really good points. I think some of that we already. I, I think a lot of our builders, when they have an interest in an area, they reach out directly to Joey and the staff to talk about what is the capacity in that area. I don't know that we've ever formalized it, though, as a process to really push it, other than probably through maybe Ryan's efforts and then just in general. Ryan's when, one person. Well, with Ryan a, and his, with and a his staff. a thousand directions. You, you're, you're right. And seven bosses, so, so I think we ought to figure out a way to. It, it, but you're right. That's what I'm saying. I think we, we can take a look at how we formalize that process and how we would do it and try to grow. It is, it, it is, it's a, a cornerstone of the city, so we need to, to treat it that way. Okay. Thank you, Robert. No problem. So continuing, uh, other revenue sources uh, estimated to be about $11.1 in FY018. Uh, this is impacted by uh, the loss of Nye America revenues. Uh, the service will end or ended in FY018, so as a part of the FYO 19 forecast. I don't think that's fair to categorize that as a loss. That was just a carry. Okay. It, it's a carry. Well, but if you it, put that on the internet, somebody's like, why'd you lose? We didn't lose. Okay. It was a carry. Fair. Fair. But the, 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 the point from is in 19, those revenues aren't included in the forecast of 19. We have the lower Richmond, Richland County Agreement and it has some impacts with regard to revenues. Do we have an agreement? Did I miss something? <laughs> We're working on a legal agreement. Clint will okay. be back before us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he won't probably wait till tonight. And then we have other, other revenue sources. So this is just a breakdown of the revenues. Uh, 
So, Robert, you know, one of the things that we seem to, to struggle with in, in the plant, too, is how do, how do we reduce that billing adjustment? I mean, we seem to have still today a lot of issues with these billing adjustments. I mean, are we are reinvesting in, in new software. What What is... You know, I know we've talked about the meters and this and that, but clearly, you know, there's a problem. I won't dispute that at all. Um, it, the billing adjustment number is higher than it needs to be, and, and I think, um, you know, we've been through a crisis of customer confidence, and we're trying to restore that. Um, I do think the AMI system is going to help us substantially restore some of that confidence and that information about leaks or water usage being in the customer's hands every day through a mobile device or, or internet or however they choose to access that information. I believe that's going to reduce our billing adjustments. Our consultant is telling us that's going to bring those down. That's our big tool that's out there to make a, a significant dent in it. In the interim, we're trying to use our customer advocate process and uh, to, to regain some of that confidence and um, to to try to buffer that number a little bit. What, what it, Robert, this is probably more for you than Clint. What is an acceptable billing adjustment ratio in, in a system our size? It, it's never acceptable, so I probably shouldn't use that term. But you know, what is what, what do you see out there? I mean, what, what's okay, so I don't, to be honest with you, Councilman, I don't have an exact ratio off the top of my head with a, a billing adjustment. Um, so but I, I, I can't. To be honest with you, I can't give you an exact. <laughs> they have one. Yeah, I can't. Because sometimes <laughs> they say that I, they don't, but they do. I, I, no, I can't. But what, what I, what, what I, what I, what I can say is, typically, the billing adjustment or any adjustment, it could be a bad debt adjustment. It's specific to the utility, so. You know, I could come and say 10 utilities in the southern USA are looking at a 5 or 2 or percent and a half adjustment. Your adjustment may be different. But the biggest thing I always preach is if you're making progress in reducing that adjustment, whatever the measure is, and it, 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 based on the forecast we have here, uh, progress is, is budgeted and forecasted. And I think in, in three years, we should be three, four years, we should be close to less than 50 to 60% of the adjustment that we currently have. Okay. So, so that's a good thing. That's progress. Thank you. Right. So revenue requirements, uh, O&M, we're looking at in FYO 19, about a 91.7 million forecast in O&M. It includes inflation, clean water efforts, and, it's a, and we're utilizing about a 4% escalation factor. Uh, we have included debt service payments, uh, which start at about 32.1. And we are issuing debt annually over the forecast period, which is 19 through 23. What, okay. what, is, it, what is the O&M budget? It, when we get out of the clean water 2020, what does that adjustment look like on our budget? Can you repeat that, please? Um, Even though it was a cookie. So sorry. We get, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was a cookie. <laughs> I think he's hungry, too. <laughs> uh, the 2020, so when we get through, you know, our requirements in the 2020, what is that, how does that affect our O&M? Me, meaning if O&M will fall we off. If, of capital. Well, that's what I'm curious is, is it 120 or is it more because we're playing catch-up at that point? Well, I think um, part of what we're doing through the program is, is changing the way we operate and 
and part of changing the way we operate is, and Joe, you can probably speak better this than me, but, but we are investing in our system as we go. And so hopefully you won't see big, big spikes of 150 or 180 million to try to level off that level, that level of investment from a capital perspective, but also from the O&M perspective. And so some of the things the program management staff is doing for us, we are trying, starting to try to do ourselves and take over some of those activities. We'll need to do that. We may have to staff, staff up in a few more areas, so you may see a little bit of growth in the O&M budget for, for that to offset what we're, we're paying for with program dollars. Um, the, the investment um, of $120 million a year at, right now and for the foreseeable five, six, eight years, that seems like a good level of necessary investment as we project out. Um, once we finish this round of projects that we've got identified, the, the cycle starts over to some degree. So there's always that continual investment so we don't find ourselves in a hole again. So do we have a forecast of what you think those, those investments will be down the road? We do for five years right now. That, that's what we've been looking at, a five-year. We haven't done a 10- and 20-year look to, to that level of specificity. So. Is that something that we should look at now and look at the 10-year? I mean, 20 years is a stretch because we don't – I mean, there's technology and everything else, but – in the ten-year stretch, and especially in the wastewater world, is is average. Yes, sir. And um, in our five-year CIP, there are the projects laid out for the next five years, and then there's a group of year six projects that haven't been planned out. But those are really the next five-year projects, and some of it is, you know, dependent upon growth. A lot of it is just, you know, in reinvesting in infrastructure that we've already got. We can look at those numbers and have a, a more detailed discussion about that. I think it would be great for us just to have an idea what that forecast would look like. Okay. okay. We'll do that. Thank you. So looking at your, the bill impacts, uh, meaning the typical bill for your typical customer, in 2008 that bill was about $37.37. .37. Uh, in FYO 18, that bill is about $54.94, which calculates to be about a 3.9% uh, compounded annual growth. Um, you know, we look at this and there are various perspectives that can be taken uh, by looking at this. One of which, okay, it's close to inflation. We're doing something. We're taking action. Yes, that's true. Uh, it is. We've done something. We've taken action and we're able to, you know, implement infrastructure and provide the service as required. The other side is, you know, there are a few years where we didn't have an increase and we had a few lumps. So the argument could be made that that 3.9% could even be lower if in some of those initial years where we didn't have increases, we had small and steady increases. So the, the point is, you know, steady increases over the long term of the system uh, helps to sustain financial health and, you know, the operations resilience of the system. Okay. Thanks. So looking at revenue adjustments uh, <clears throat> and just, you know, making some points about the revenue adjustments, uh, it's a balanced approach uh, whereby we go about funding all your operating and capital obligations. We maintain your debt service target of a 2.0. We utilize a combination of, of debt financing and cash on hand. And with that nine, and just that, that 9.76 increase is across the board, uh, applied evenly to your water and, and wastewater sewer rates. And to reiterate, it, the increase goes to support your operating and capital obligations. So looking at the financial plan and looking at the assumptions around the financial plan, We've highlighted a 9.76 revenue growth, revenue increase, along with the 1% customer growth. Uh, it's $120 million CIP, of which 28.6% will be funded by cash, 70.7% will be funded by our revenue bonds, and 0.7% will be funded by West Columbia. Uh, we maintain our financial metrics. There's no NAMERCA forecasted in FYO 19. We keep 
incorporated the necessary billing adjustments as, as we've just discussed. Um, we've also incorporated uh, the O&M requirements for, for special service customers that we're planning to come on board to use the EWS, uh, along with revenues associated with EWS. Uh, and listed below are the annual bond issuances we plan over the forecast period. So at the end of FYO 18, current year, we're looking at about a 96.5, 96.7 in 19, <coughs> 88.1 in 20, 82.9 in 21, 81.9 in 22, and a 73.3 in 23. And we'll, we'll have more details on the next slide. So this is, this is the financial plan. Uh, as we said, we started out with revenues of about 138.6, and in, in 19, that revenue number grows to about 161.9. Over the forecast period, that revenue grows to about 219. Uh, operating expenses uh, grow to about 111.9 by 2023, and debt service obligations, meaning Bonds I just listed that we fund, we issue debt to the proposed debt. In addition to the existing, the existing special proposed grows to about 55 uh, million by FY 2023. Ultimately, we're able to fund our obligations, uh, meet our debt service coverage requirements with the proposed increases on an annual basis, starting with 9.76 in 19, a 5.98 in 20, an 8.97 in 21, a 7.28 in 22, and a 6.78 in 23. And all of those figures would be adjusted yearly like you did the 13. Is that a scared with plan? Yes, sir. And th this becomes a part of what we call at the beginning the integrated financial plan, which then is a part of your budgeting cycle that we take a look at on an annual basis. Okay. So looking at the financing plan. All we're doing now is just showing how we get to that annual 120 every year. Uh, so in 19, we're looking at that 96.7 in bonds, 23 in cash, and the remainder in West Columbia funding, so we're looking at about a 19.2% in cash funding. You know, by the time we get to 2023, we get to about a 38.7 in cash funding. Any any questions there as it relates to the financing plan? Okay. okay. So <clears throat> this slide goes about highlighting the FYO 19 scenario, based on the major components, uh, you know, that make up the plan. The revenues and the revenue increase, which is about a 9.76. The capital financing that shows the distribution between bonds, cash, and West Columbia, and the debt service coverage. The thing I want to highlight here is, whenever we go through the process of rate setting, it somewhat becomes an art as it relates to the level of the increase you require, the amount of cash you have available that can be used to support the financing of your capital program, and meeting your debt service coverage. So at times, if you don't have enough of a rate increase, we may not hit that 2.0. But if you have some cash, you may be able to use some of that cash to reduce that capital requirement which then won't, will allow you to meet your debt service coverage because you're not floating as big of a, a bond which will drive up your debt service requirement. Okay? So this becomes a, a balancing act with regard to you know, what type of a rate increase you can put in place to make sure we meet our coverage requirements and how much cash we can utilize to offset that requirement. So this is the balance that we have in place for FYO 19. Any questions there? No? Okay. Okay. 
So <clears throat> looking at the utility bill impacts, on average, for as we can see, it's about a 9.7% increase across the board. So all customers will see the increase. For the typical residential customer, they'll see an increase of about $5.30, $0.36. And then how you compared as it relates to neighboring utilities, uh, this highlights that you're, you know, about in the middle or at the lower end of the middle. So it's, uh, you're currently... 60 to $100 a year on the in, average home owner. Can you repeat that, please? It's anywhere from 60 to $100 a year increase per homeowner. Per year. Per year. Okay. Five, eight bucks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There, there, thereabouts. Yeah. Yes, sir. Again, the colors are hard to read, so I'm sure when people are they're watching online or something, they're not able to see that. So you'll see if you get a good Sorry about that. I will. Sorry. Thank you. So. Shows is very comparing very favorable uh, against other uh, cities. Yes, sir. So. So do you all have any questions with regard to the process, where we're at, what we've done, where we're going? It's good to see the proposed increase come down significantly. Okay. And the, and the future year being much more modest uh, okay. as well. That's, that's encouraging. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please, we'll spend a lot of time with Mr. Davis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, at least enough time with us that the... the <laughs> See, we got a telegraph punch. It's, uh, it's uh, a good work. Well, well th thank you all very much for all on the same, taking the time. All on the same page. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Finally got there. <laughs> thank you, Robert. Thank you, thank you Robert. Next up on the agenda, item three. Is our fiscal year 2018-19 budget workshop? Ms. Melissa Kaufman, Budget and Program Management Director. I'm sorry, I don't have the. Nice soothing voice that Mr. Chambers has for everybody, but hopefully I can still keep your attention and we can talk. Uh, my voice is probably normal. It just doesn't sound like his. <laughs> doesn't have a nice accent. Um, Miss Erica is passing out a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, which wasn't in your packet, so if you want a hard copy, um, you may have some. There's it's just hard copy if you like it, and also another copy of the agenda that was published on the um, agenda if you would like a copy of that, and then there's also copies available on the table for anyone who might want to follow along. <clears throat> so we are continuing our water and our um, FY 18-19 proposed budget workshops. Um, we are still going through our budget um, cycle with City Council. Um, of course, as we are here today, we're talking about water, sewer, our water and sewer operating, our stormwater operating, and parking operating. Um, I will touch base a little bit on the water and sewer budget, um, not to sort of um, just maybe add a little different perspective from the information that, that Robert's already provided to you with regards to our water, our water and sewer sales, and our revenue streams. Um, First up is just a look at our water revenue, our, our revenues for water and sewer. Of course, our revenues are 160 million projected. Um, majority of that revenue coming in from water sales, 60%, um, about 30, and then 38% coming in from sewer. The revenues that the water, water and sewer revenues that are before you today include the reflected 9.76 rate increase that's proposed to you. So as we're going through this budget discussion. Just want to keep that into perspective. Any additional questions about revenues? 
On the expenditure side, um, of course, the water and sewer budget, I want this is just graphically just to demonstrate that the pie chart on the top demonstrates the entire budget. You can see the largest portion of the pie is our operations and departments, um, which is about 58%. So that would be all of the departments charged to water and sewer, which would be the, the folks that help maintain our water and sewer system, of course. Um, debt service and transfer to capital improvements, both of which are funding of our of our, of our 100, annual $120 million water and sewer improvement program. They make up 25% of the budget, so 20, about 25% of our budget uh, annual budget goes into the um, improvement system. Of course, we also fund our, our water improvement system with bonds, so this just reflects the cash portion of the, of the actual annual, annual allocations. The pie chart on the bottom just reflects the actual departments that are charged. <coughs> So 71%, if you recall, we've um, we have a little we've we've rearranged the water and sewer organization a little bit. So utilities and engineering are now each separate departments. So utilities alone is 71%. Of course, utilities includes the operational folks. That includes uh, the plants, uh, both the water treatment plants, the wastewater plants, as well as our water maintenance crews, our wastewater maintenance crews, um, and the folks that maintain the system. And of course, those budgets also include. As we'll see on the next slide, that that's the their budgets include not just the personnel, but they also include those projects that are um, annual reoccurring type of maintenance projects that are not capital. And so, of course, that's a large portion of their budgets as well. The next largest um, department in the um, water and sewer fund is going to be the engineering services. And I'm sorry that piece of the that description of the of the pie is kind of high is covered in the um, actually in the itself, but that's about 13%. Of course, we also have public works, streets divisions. Those would be the um, this portion of streets that actually goes and retires utility cuts. Um, as public works street division has, has an account just in all, most of our operating funds based upon the activity that streets is doing. Um, of course, the police and CSO security reflects the um, security at our, at our treatment plants and our water and, soon, water and sewer owned facilities. So that's the portion that that maintains there. Fire portion, of course, is the fire hydrant maintenance folks, the fire hydrant flushers, and those folks that help maintain the hydrant systems. Finance as a portion, um, economic development, GIS systems, and then general services is, of course, our, um, our water and sewer facilities, um, building facilities, and then customer care is our customer care center. And it also now reflects our field service folks. Any questions about our either of these two charts? Just a, some highlights, and these are very, very highlights of the um, water and sewer budget. As mentioned, the proposed budget is $161.9 million, which is an increase of $9 million over the current year budget. Um, it's about 6% or, um, 6 of an increase. It does reflect the 9.7% um, proposed rate increase. The CIP, again, the capital improvement program, as discussed, our annual our annual consideration for CIP has is 120 million as it has been for recent years and projected to be for the next few years, as we'll um, discuss earlier, come back with the, a longer term um, view of that what that CIP looks like. This year in the water and sewer budget, 21 million is being transferred to the CIP. That's an increase because 10 million for the past two years was going towards our um, flood recovery program. So we've set aside those funds now to help us through the reimbursement for the repairs program, and so we don't need to transfer out at this point any longer for that um, as we continue to make our way through the FEMA process and also through the HMGP or hazard mitigation process. The remainder, of course, of the 120 comes from um, issuing of bonds as well as some uh, fund balance from water and sewer. The Water and Sewer Improvement Program, of course, continues to focus on Clean Water 2020 efforts um, of the of the water and sewer. I don't have this on here. Forty million is for of uh, forty million is uh, for water projects. Eighty million will be for sewer um, system projects. Um, pretty much every sewer project is somehow related to the Clean Water 2020 um, program in the consent decree. And uh, um, $15 million of the Water and Sewer Program is towards the AMI-AMR project that is um, um, also included in the CIP program, and that's a phased-in approach. The operating budgets, um, as shown earlier, is $94.3 million, which is an increase of about 3.7 or right at 4%. 
um, most of that increase is related to um, uh, personnel matter or personnel costs for health care and state retirement system. Um, again, as mentioned, some of those increases, some of the operating budgets also include maintenance, annual maintenance contracts um, or ma annual maintenance work that's not capitalized, but is, of course, part of our ongoing maintenance and regular or trying to get to more of a regular and routine um, schedule of our of our system um, maintenance. One of the challenges that you're going to hear us talk about with regards, especially to um, an area like water and sewer, which has a lot of uh, a, a lot of the um, has a lot of employees who are um, difficult are having a difficulty in terms of hire and retaining, especially with regards to skilled labor, um, but also especially those folks with CDLs. A lot of challenges you're going to hear throughout the city um, with departments that have employees that requires um, the commercial driver's license ability to hire and then retain them because of right now the job market being so competitive for that particular kill set. In the shortage oh, yes. CDL, all you have to do is ride down the highway mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the city, we provide a very good training program to get those folks trained up so even as we get them trained, you know, they quickly can turn back out. So there's been a lot of challenges sort of keeping that, that system, the, those employees retained. And then, of course, too, also the professional side, which is, um, as previously discussed with regards to sort of as the program managers, for especially Clean Water 2020, as we sort of hit the, um, the that um, intersection of where the, cons the consulting staff intersects with the hiring on of, of city staff, being able to bring on that professional staff to do some of those pro um, programs in-house um, is, is also some somewhat of a challenge with regards to being able to hire and, of course, also retain them. We have some, well, training, um, I don't know if our training costs are that extensive as much as it is um, just to be able to retain them even once they're trained at all. We have to ask more of the folks who, who are handling the training to be able to address that piece. But I don't know how much of a, of a lure we have with keeping folks in here once they've gone. Missy, it, it's a it, CDL or a challenge right now. Um, we do we tend to train them up and and they'll move on, and they can make a lot more money. And um, so there is a, you know, the issue is with jobs that folks are required to have the CDL for. And when they get that level of, of license, when they've met the job requirement, we don't reward them for getting that level of license. And so we've been talking internally a little bit about some sort of reward system to try to hold on to the folks once they achieve their CDL, they've met that requirement. The job may say you have to get it within six months or 12 months in order to retain that job. But if they get that, that's something that can help them advance in their career here as well. Right. I mean, we obviously want people to do well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The very same time, we want people to figure out how to get a training program. Well, the other thing with that, and I spoke to Pam about this, this might have been a year ago, and I'm not sure you know, how, how far she's gotten with it, but um, I had a conversation with um, Rich on one, you know, regarding partnering with them on helping train, you know, their, their seniors at CDLs and there's an opportunity for them to have jobs waiting for them. So, I mean, I think as a workforce development tool, that would be something we need to look at because it certainly would help not just us, but, you know, get people being able to get into jobs. All of those avenues are certainly being explored. Um, and, and I think some of them are, you know, they'll be able to help help bridge some of the gaps. Um, again, the, the market sort of challenges right now, that's also that, uh, that it's harder to keep up with that pace. But I think there are some efforts and programs that, that are being taken advantage of to help, help fill that void. Um, most of what water and sewers department's budgets are operating are focused on this year, especially um, is related to our customer care. As, as Clint mentioned earlier, our customer advocate program and activities. Um, and then, of course, a lot of activity that will be coming with regards to our mobile field services, so that um, improvements in mobile field services, so that the crews will be able to um, better send and receive information while out working um, on the sites instead of having to go out on the site, 
with, with static information and come back and read and load information. So hopefully a lot of advancements over the next uh, 12 months that you'll we'll, we'll be able to demonstrate. Any other questions about water and sewer? Okay. Next we have stormwater. Um, stormwater, of course, primary source of revenue for the water, the stormwater program is going to be the stormwater fee. There are some other small um, revenues that, that attribute to the fund, but as you can see, they're um, very minimal. Expenditure-wise, um, there are several departments operating out of the out of the stormwater fund. Public Works has mentioned our street division, storm drains, maintenance folks, and they are also the construction crews. So that's also out of stormwater that represents 30% of the budget. And then 22% for engineering. That would also include engineering services and real estate areas. So um, being able to, to design projects and then also to being able to handle all the easement work, um, as you, some of you are aware of, um, that's required to be able to do a lot of the work on these properties. So those make up the majority of the operating departments. Um, there is a 20% now reference for debt service. That's new, obviously, to the stormwater budget now that we have the stormwater program and we'll be issuing debt on the stormwater program. So that represents 20%. Of course, that's for funding the comprehensive um, stormwater um, improvement program. Uh, we also have a... Uh, um, General fund, a direct, indirect cost transfer or cost allowance for general fund. And then reserve that's also part of our um, funding requirements to meet our, our debt coverage. Missy, we're beginning to get some pipes in the ground now and some projects completed. Well, let's, I'll move on to the next slide. Right. So under stormwater budget, um, the, the pie charts referenced earlier, earlier that budget is $13.4 million. That's an increase of 836000 over the current year, about 6.6%. Of course, it continues the proposed rate adjustments that City Council adopted last year. Of course, that still would require that we need to adopt them again for this year. However, the rate adjustment for this year is much significantly less than what was adopted when the original plan was put in place last year. So um, the stormwater fees for um, this year pr pr are proposed to increase 74 cents per um, equivalent residential unit, or ERU, um, which is what residents pay per month for the stormwater program. So that basically takes the fee from 11.80 per month to $12.54 a month, a little less than $9 a year total um, increase that the um, residents will pay for the stormwater program. The CIP program reflects $10 million for this year. That's actually because there's a number of activities still going on for this year. The total projected CIP over the next three to five years that City Council um, adopted from last year is $93 million in stormwater improvements. So it's pretty significant, pretty expansive, um, considering prior years' activities for our stormwater, um, stormwater system. Um, some of the other activities that have occurred recently, of course, is that the stormwater program manager contract was awarded in March. So that's going to be um, help to get things moving a lot quicker and sooner here um, with the program. Tonight on council's agenda for the first approval of the, um, of the bond ordinance for the first bond issuance for the stormwater program, and that's going to be $50 million. So that's going to really start to progress things along um, very well. The operating improvement continues to focus on the needs of alleviating flood and um, flooding, um, especially nuisance flooding, and then, of course, helping to approve our um, promoting our water quality program. Those things that are currently underway include Wallace Street and Martin Luther King Park um, improvements. Harlem Heights, um, I think some of you are familiar, familiar with. Those activities will happen as easements come into place, so those will be some activities happening here soon. And then 18... I'm sorry. They met last night on that. They're about ready to go. Yeah. The, the easements are Certainly. still out there. Yeah. And that's an issue. Where, where are we with... The Shandon project, which has been on the the board for as long as I've been around, um, and part of what we are trying to do is make sure that we finally had the money to get to it. Yes, sir. Um, we actually uh, right now in the middle. 
We had uh, 18, uh, 19 consultants that submitted for our stormwater RFQ. Uh, the selection committee has met. I have not received back those results yet, but um, I understand we'll be moving forward with those, and they will be coming before you. Once those are on board, we'll, that will be uh, the highest priority, is getting these studies uh, performed by these consultants. So we expect so, negotiation of uh, scopes. From the study to the scope to the dirt being moved. It's been a couple of years. Range? Gonna be a couple of years, and we've we've um, had neighbor meetings with the um, Shannon group. I'm not sure if you were there last year, but we'll once we get the consultant on board, we'll have another meeting and try to lay out what the time frames are. But we let them know that it would take the time to do the feasibility because we'd like for them to not only look at the hard piping but also the green infrastructure. But I thought we had done that the study already. We have done a traditional hard piping, and then Dr. Gorgel came in and we did the a green infrastructure. Which some of it was did work according to some of the constituents, and then we brought Cox and Dinkins back, and they looked at the the uh, restraints and constrictions under Rosewood, so they made some suggestions there. So, what we had talked about is some of these uh, critical areas that are flooding, even looking at creating a park in some of these areas, if if that's what it would be. The neighbors were um, very open to looking at it out of the box thinking. So that's what the consultant we're going to have them help us with. Yeah, they, the, the pervious asphalt. So they took the the uh, the wide streets in Shandon, and they were able to create along the parking aisles the pervious asphalt, um, not under the drive lanes, but under the um, parking stalls. So the water has been infiltrating, and it's come stored underneath the um, boxes. They have storage under the boxes, and eventually the overflow would go through our um, hard piping system. The neighbors seem to think so. Um, we've talked to them, both Robert and I, Anderson, um, as well as our construction management group, and they came out during the construction and said they've saw major improvements, definitely on Amherst. That that group came out and were, they were very pleased. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Shana, yes, sir. You talk, you initially, you met with a group some months ago. Uh, yes, sir. That fed into, uh, That's correct. That Yes, sir. Uh, and I heard Missy mention that today. Where yes. are we with that? They've started construction. We were waiting until after MLK, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the um, St. Patrick's Day, where they have a lot of that uh, the activities in that park. Um, but they were beginning at the beginning of April, so they're out there right now starting construction. All right. Other Missy, you're going to identify other places other than the two areas? Yes, sir. So, so next, there the projects for eighteen nineteen include Penn Branch, Gills Creek, Rocky Branch at Whaley Street, Randall Avenue at North North Main. Those were some highlighted projects. We'll bring back to you the actual CIP for the coming year. We'll bring that to you in one of the following council meetings, so you can see exactly which projects are are scheduled and planned. And as mentioned in our water and sewer budget, of course, health care costs and state retirement system are impacting all departments' budget throughout the city. Um, we just make sure that that's also noted as one of the one of the impacts on the budgets overall. <coughs> Finally, we have the parking fund budget, one of our other um, one of our three enterprise funds, which would be the parking fund. We have the. Um, Revenues for parking um, parking fund include street meters at 34%, non-moving violations at 25 and garages and lots account for 39%. Expenditure-wise, um, parking services, um, park, uh, the departments in, park, in the parking fund, there's basically four areas. The largest would be parking services um, and then parking facilities. Um, L over parking services and Kelvin and Robert Anderson with um, parking facilities. We also have finance, which is the parking payments, um, um, very small portion, and then a small portion for public work, sign shops, um, activities there as well. It's also um, those are combined are really less than two percent. Of course, a large portion of the water and, of the parking fund is going to be debt service at thirty three percent, and there is some transfers for internal service activities and a um, general fund at transfer of, of five hundred thousand, which is six percent. As far as the activities of the parking fund, the proposed budget is $8.6 million. 
It's an increase of about 684000 or about 9% over the current year. Um, as mentioned, all of the sources of revenue, of course, the increases are due primarily um, to just um, improvements of, of collections, but then also the, the passport parking system that's now fully implemented in place has been very beneficial in terms of helping to generate revenues um, or, or collect on those revenues. And then the um, addition of in, in enforcement of our parking contracts. Operating budgets total $4.9 million, which is an increase of $678,000 or 16%. Part of that addition is the is two new positions that are being added to help expand our residential parking enforcement program that has um, issues on pretty much, I'm hearing, a daily basis, um, part enforcement of those parking issues and helping to address some of the concerns that our um, residents are, 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 are facing on a regular basis. What, what is that? Um, Elaborate on that. Sure. Well, either that or if Elle wants to come up and talk about it as well. No, not that much. Okay. I just okay. try to understand. Some of the residential areas in the air, some of the residential areas more in the downtown area. On that you're only allotted homeowner versus tenant so many parking permits and the number of students living in those homes are taking up um, over their allotment so, so we're, we are we're, receiving we're, we're in the negative on that we are we receive daily complaints um, of enforcement in the residential permitted areas so yeah, I, I was at the University Hills neighborhood uh, a week ago and that issue came up and they were saying that Daytime, the enforcement was pretty good, but at nighttime, when it goes over to CPC, they think CPD, they, they think there might be a disconnect in how to enforce it. I might not regard to it as a disconnect as much as an ongoing partnership of communication of what is happening in what particular area. So we do have communication, um, certainly when we no longer enforce after seven. Um, then it would fall upon CPD, but it's communication between the two of us um, to enforce those areas. Uh, they, they were trying to explain it to me, and I couldn't understand it either. I mean, it, it, it varies from street to street. So wait. It does. You're talking about permitted parking. You're talking, yeah, you're talking about permitted, permitted parking. parking, correct. I probably should, I should, probably should have been out there in the mm -hmm. discussion of the enforcement. It's enforcement of the residents' permanent parking, not the, we're not going to be enforcing parking in residents. There's not permanent parking. There's not, the enforcement's not happening yet. Unless they're in, uh, parked unsafely or in front of fire hydrants, and then it would be on CPD, and again, that's the after hours. Um, that wouldn't be parking services. So we do recognize the influx of students, and more students are living in those residential areas, um, and they're struggling with the parking. Anything we can do about that? Yeah. I mean, is there a solution? Yeah. The two positions. The residents are paying for the From enforcement. Oh, so, so. But, but <laughs> what, will, and, what will the new position, how will uh, they be authorized to go to person? Because if I understand it correctly, it's after 7 o'clock, you've got the most. Huh? you got the most. Uh, yeah. Both. Yeah. Yes, sir. Both day side and um, nighttime. But during the day, um, the two additional positions will um, give us the opportunity to better enforce those areas. After 7 o'clock? No, before 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So what do we do after 7? Communicate with that man right over there. <laughs> we continue that partnership of communication. So, um, and that's ongoing. Partnership. Our partnership, um, the vast majority of our complaints are day side. And trying to get to all of those areas, um, those two positions will make a significant difference. Are these yes, cruisers or walking persons? Or how does that proceed? They're on foot um, at the moment. They're dropped off in a particular area. So they're driven and dropped off, and then they're on foot. It takes a little bit longer.
Thank you, Henry. And two things. I did get a residential permit yesterday. It's in my car, so during the break, I'll give that permit to you. And um, Passport was not working yesterday. Um, I don't know. I'm not aware. To my knowledge, we didn't receive Luckily, any I did not get a ticket, but it wasn't working yesterday. Okay. So okay. they kept, every time I tried to go to the app, it said we were doing things. I don't, I don't, does it work on Wi-Fi? I was, <laughs> it does. It does. I was on Assembly Street. It usually works on there, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was a issue with it connecting to something, but it, I tried it like five times, and it wouldn't work. And then later, like about an hour later, I went and tried it again just to see if it connected, and it wouldn't. At which time we confirm we receive complaints um, with Passport not functioning, and we confirm with Passport the system is down um, during that time frame and generally an hour or two thereafter, we stop enforcement so we're not wrongfully citing folks if the Passport app is not working because it's doing so well for the city at the moment. And now that USC um, brought it on board live in the fall, we're um, wrapping up marketing, communication, um, so it's just as much a win for them as it is us, and we anticipate additional revenues in the future based on that partnership um, with the USC students. It's doing very I've, well. I've never had a problem with it before. Does it go out often, or do y'all get that? We don't. Okay. We don't. I've never had a problem with it before. Generally, it's a system um, upgrade on their end that they maybe are slow to inform us of, but again, we cease enforcement so that we're not wrongfully citing folks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My apology, Mr. Davis. I should have probably been more clear. It's residential permitted areas, not just residential. I, I could. We're not going around no problem. enforcing um, neighborhood parking, although I'm sure there's <laughs> well, probably some areas that would like it. We only do that in the university neighborhood. We don't do it in the rest of the city. Uh, I don't know if it's all that, but. Uh -huh. So, absolutely. Well, the, um, just to sort of wrap up. Um, some of the scheduled programming, of course, with the parking garages, one one of the major activities will be painting of one garage, um, of course, and then the routine maintenance. Preference, of course, is to do more than that. However, this is um, what we're able to find within this coming year. And um, finally, um, other partners that, that Elle would also mention would be our economic development department in regards to helping businesses um, know the services that we have with regards to our parking and the attraction of, of doing business downtown. Any questions about the parking fund? Just as a reminder, um, unless there's any other questions about what we've already presented so far, um, today, of course, we did a high-level overview of the water and sewer, stormwater and parking funds. Next week, we will be bringing back to you health care, um, employee health care discussions. Um, we are also bringing back the hospitality tax, um, proposed changes to the funding process that was requested and has been asked to be considered. So we will be bringing back that discussion. And we'll be bringing back part one of the general fund. Is, is it possible for me to get the materials for the May 1st meeting prior to? I have an engagement outside. As soon as we have them available, absolutely. Yes. So that's the schedule for next week's um, budget workshop that was being scheduled. Um, I believe we've scheduled for our typical time from 2, but there won't be an, a meet, an evening meeting. It's just the starting at 2 o'clock and wrap up whenever we finish up. Um, going forward, the May 1st and May 15th is when we'll be um, bringing back the the entire proposed budgets, um, and then bringing back um, capital budgets as well. Not sure which order we may bring those in. I, some of that will depend on our discussions from next week. Then we are scheduled at this point. The May 15th is the last advertised meeting before we advertise the budget. So unless there's, of course, that doesn't mean there couldn't be more discussions if, if needed be or necessary. However, that would be the last regular council meeting before we have to advertise the budget for the public hearing on June the 5th. So that would be public hearing and first reading, and then we will do second reading on June the 19th. Any other questions or concerns?
Obviously, we can both still participate um, electronically uh, on the first if necessary, but let's just toss some dates around. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. It may just need to be another day. Is that a bad day for you, too? I'm sorry. No, it's just, I can't do the eighth. Okay, okay. Well, let's, let's, um, this might start a little dialogue, and if it, if it works with the buzz, if it does not, then, then we'll, we can <coughs> participate electronically. The, the 24th, the to confirm, we're doing just a workshop that afternoon, no evening meeting, correct? That was what was scheduled and planned for, just the regular, yeah. Because I think both, all three of those are going to take some time. Should we start at noon? I was just wondering what time it is. Normally we start at 2, for, but I mean, I think those are, th especially number 1 and number 2 and number 3, all three of them. I mean, they're going to take some time and some discussion. Noon work. I mean, I'd rather get done earlier than leave than than roll into the evening. Morning would be, well, morning would be better for me, but I mean, I'm fine with meeting here at nine. Let's look at the morning. Let's look at the morning of the twenty fourth. Um, well, in the morning. Yeah, yeah, that, that works. That's fine. I have a quick status conference. Y'all want to try to shoot for nine? Uh, twenty eight. I Fourth, we have Before. a scheduled meeting at two, but what we're saying is start early. We got a meeting on Park Street, but Missy can cover that. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Twenty-four. Breakfast. <laughs> we take more fish and eggs. Fish and eggs. Thank you, folks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. All right, we got a little break for uh, a few minutes. Hey, young people, how are y'all? Are you cool guys students or, or uh, where, are you, where are you in school? I, I, as if I can't see the game talk. Uh, yeah. Are, you, are, you, are you guys doing something for class or? Are you? Yeah. All right. Well, Who's the spokesperson? Who's, tell us something. Usually, usually democracy is a little more exciting than this. Uh, uh, what are you guys studying? Journalism? Okay, good job. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Are we okay. upstairs at 3.30? Yes. Uh, yes, we'll be upstairs okay. at 3.30. Right. Good deal. All right. Good deal. All right. Good deal. All right. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Everyone's got busy days and afternoons, so I want to go ahead and, um, and get started. Um, Madam Clerk, we already called the roll downstairs, so we won't do that again. Uh, but in the effort of um, trying to make sure we accommodated uh, significantly differing work schedules, we want to do something a, a bit different and plan two uh, public hearings today to accommodate everyone's um, uh, challenging schedules. So this is the first of two in, today in, in Council Chambers on uh, Ordinance 2018-001. Uh, I have at least the first sheet of people who signed up to speak, but just looking at the crowd here, there are only seven people who signed up. I'm sure there are more than seven people here who plan to, uh, to participate today, so I think Nikki's going to check and see if we have an, another one. Uh, but unless there's a, a, a presentation of sorts on, on, the, on the ordinance, um, as uh, presented by the uh, Public Safety uh, Subcommittee, uh, then we can go directly into, into the, the public hearing. All right. Seeing that? Uh, is there something from Hemlop or anyone else? Let's make sure. Okay. And we'll jump right into the public hearing. And the first person we have signed up is April Lucas. Hey, Counselor. I'd like to see um, my spot. I'll come number two if that's okay. But uh, Dick Harpoolian has to be out of town, so he can take my place. When, when you have to be out of town, Dick, we could have rescheduled this meeting. Uh, <laughs> I would think, Steve, you'd be more than happy to get me out of town. <laughs> <laughs> Quick. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mayor, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak on this uh, proposed ordinance, um, and I would be uh, uh, less than candid if I didn't think it's um, same old, same old. The, the, the Rickman ordinance is the same ordinance with some minor tweaks, and here's my question. Why wasn't, why wasn't the old ordinance enforced? What is the promise that they're going to enforce this one when you didn't enforce the last one? Uh, it was against the law to do a bunch of stuff after 2 o'clock. They did it. The sled busted them for selling liquor after 2 o'clock. No one ever went 
after two o'clock, not one, or, not one, one violation was written up in seven years. So this is lipstick on a pig. This is much ado about nothing. And, and Mr. Rickman, I know you've got friends that run bars and I'm sure they have families and they need sustenance, but there are people, 280 kids went to the emergency room last year with alcohol poisoning. 80% of them said they had their last drink in five points. Five points is out of control. Five, now, you can shake your head, those are the facts. Uh, I'm sorry, my turn to talk. You can talk all you want afterwards. Um, the fact of the matter is that the conditions down there are abhorrent. The 2 a.m. Uh, uh, ordinance is, should be easily done. They don't need to serve any, any alcohol Thank after 2 a.m. Uh, we have succeeded in shutting one of the bars down without your help. We're gonna shut down every bar in five points without your help apparently uh, because the city does not have the will to enforce its own laws. And I, I swear, I've been coming to city council since 1972, and this is pitiful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arpootland. Safe travels. Uh, Ms. Lucas, you up next? All right. Did you? Did you? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, if you'll indulge me, uh, this is the third public hearing on this topic. We had two separate public hearings at the committee level, but of course, some of you were not. April, thank, and thank you for sure. being here. And I, I know this is a day in which um, emotions, there may be days in which emotions can run high. Uh, I think you're going to see an extraordinary effort by a whole lot of us to, to work to control the, uh, the, the rhetoric and, and the hyperbole and the um, acid laced comments. I should have said this before Dick spoke. Um, um, so, uh, everyone else, as you, if you can, uh, judge yourselves accordingly. Uh, this is a public hearing, so this is our opportunity to hear from you. Um, hopefully, the words in which uh, comes from everyone's mouth on any side of this issue, and if there's several sides, uh, hopefully those words are edifying uh, and, and, and we'll just move forward accordingly. So, just wanted to say that. Thank you, April. Oh, thank you. My mama always told me I was too reasonable, so <laughs> hopefully that will come through today. Um, in any event, it is the third public hearing, and uh, some of you have not uh, had the benefit of the record uh, that we built at the committee meeting. So I would uh, beg your indulgence if I go a little bit over three minutes. Uh, what I'll try to do is just summarize uh, for you all the record that we think we built um, at the committee level. Um, the, we think that that record amply supports outright repeal of the all-night permit program. Um, however, we understand that there are a lot of people who think differently than we do, so we are certainly open to discussion on ways that we can perhaps limit the number of all-night bars. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm kind of dry from all this pollen. And um, if, we can, if we can come to some, uh, find some common ground in that regard, then uh, I think we can keep right on going. Um, but let me, let me tell you why I think uh, outright repeal is still something that you should consider. There's an oversaturation of bars in five points. Um, I gave you copies of my prepared remarks and attached, you'll see, uh, a map. This is a map of the Five Points Overlay District. Um, sorry that members of the public can't see that. We didn't do an overhead um, projection. But on this map, uh, we, we mapped out 42 businesses in Five Points. Now that's a small district. That's a small geographic area. 42 bars that have ABL licenses, meaning that they can serve uh, beer, wine, and or liquor uh, on premises. Of those 42, 23 are bars. Now, there's, you know, there could be some, you know, discussion about what, what constitutes a bar. But the Five Points Association's got a classification for membership, and it lists bars under one classification and restaurants under another. So I think that's a pretty good indication. When you've got bar in your name and when you don't serve a lot of food, that's another indication. So we count 23 bars in, in uh, five points, not restaurants, but bars. Of those 23, 
18 are all night, have all night permits. Citywide, you have about 23 all night bars. Oh, that number, 18 are in five points. Now, my remarks relate to five points, but you know, this could be, happen citywide. It's not just a five points uh, issue. If you look at the next attachment, there is a map of the neighborhoods surrounding Five Points. That's the one that's blue and white, if you see that one. Yes, ma'am. Five Points is right smack in the middle of lots and lots of single family residential neighborhoods. Not high rises, not downtown condos or anything like that, single family. The ones that are in dark blue have been designated as historic neighborhoods. So you'll see many of your most historic neighborhoods, oh, I'm being beeped already, are surrounding five points. Historically, we've used five points as our commercial district. We've shopped down there. We have, uh, you know, we've uh, eaten at all the restaurants and we're all very concerned about the loss of uh, mixed retail. Uh, restaurants are relocating, maybe they're up, up operating under a different name, but they're relocating. We have um, uh, uh, Strictly Running's gone, Gibson's is gone, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, am I yes, being cut off? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Why don't you use the other, other, the other two minutes and 30 seconds that Dick didn't use? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll make a point here. Um, you asked whether there was another sign-up sheet. There is not. A lot of people who are here today, I'll ask to stand, and they're not going to make a specific statement, but several of us are going to be making reports, remarks, that will take longer than three times. So these other people, I think, would be happy to cede their time to April, to me, and to a few others who will try to make this uh, not take all day. Sure. Just, Thank you. I just gave her Dick's time, too, Tom. So I think we'll, 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 get, we'll get there. We'll get there. But if we can, we, we, we got a lot of folks, y'all, uh, and a lot of folks with differing opinions, so let's, we got to tighten it up as much as we possibly can. We can. And but thank you. This is, but this, is, this, is, this is very helpful. This, this is very is helpful. To summarize what we presented mm -hmm. at uh, the committee no, absolutely. meetings. Um, this is what distinguishes the five points situation from other situations around town. Yes, ma'am. Uh, because it is surrounded by a single family residential historic neighborhoods. When people come into the city of Columbia, uh, to visit, they go through our neighborhoods uh, as well as our commercial districts. So that's, that's one thing. Oversaturation of bars. Um, really, another thing that is, uh, distinguishes Five Points is that it's proximity to three university campuses. Three, count them. There are thousands and thousands of students living close by. The ones in the dorms at the University of South Carolina are almost all freshmen, almost all under age, and yet they get fake IDs, they head right down to five points, they wander through our neighborhoods, and they wreak havoc in our neighborhoods. I won't go through the litany of things that go wrong, but I will just summarize. Instead of giving you anecdotes, I'll summarize. Vandalism, uh, you know, banging on your door at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning because they're so intoxicated they think they're at a friend's house, passing out on your front porch, having sex on your car, urinating on your car, and a penis art in the street. I mean, it just goes on and on. This is disorderly conduct. It is a nuisance. It is a danger. It's a danger to us as residents. It's also a danger to the patron, these young, inexperienced drinkers because they're subject to um, being preyed upon by criminals. Uh, they're also subject to accidents. We had a young man killed by the train uh, in coming up from Five Points, uh, drunk as a coot. So um, I'll try to condense this a little bit. Um, this oversaturation of bars is also driving businesses out of Five Points. And I just sat down and in about 10 minutes I came up with two dozen restaurants or other retail outlets that I used to patronize. They're gone. My hairdresser left. Gibson's is gone. Um, strictly running. A lot of these didn't go out of business. 
they relocate it. Um, and part of the reason they relo relocate it is because of uh, the bars are creating the wrong kind of atmosphere. Also, they're impeding uh, parking and, and uh, the traffic, late afternoon traffic uh, for, for these retail outlets. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll come down to maybe the nut of it, and that is that the current proposal before city council um, was drafted by staff. We had asked for outright repeal. Staff has come back and put together a, a draft ordinance which changes the enforcement protocol. Um, we have great respect for Chief Holbrook. Uh, his police department is wonderful. They've done a grand job uh, with the tools that they have. Uh, we don't oppose shifting the enforcement uh, to the police department. However, uh, the, the neighborhoods uh, do not believe that that is sufficient. Uh, if we can't figure out how to limit the number of all-night bars and the number of all-night all night drinking outlets, then we don't feel secure. Uh, the reason for that is right now we've got a good team in place with Chief Holbrook, with members of council who are very aware of all the problems that have been created. However, you guys may be running for governor, for other office, Chief Holbrook may be recruited for a fabulous salary someplace else, and in a few years we have different department heads. So the institutional memory lapses, they don't understand the need for vigilance, and we find ourselves right back in the same boat. We don't want that. We need to figure out how to limit, and if we can find some common ground in that, then we'd be more than pleased to continue discussions um, and I, I would also point out that, uh, you know, Columbia is an outlier. Do we really want that status? New York City doesn't stay open as late as we do. Chicago doesn't stay open as late as we do. Los Angeles, Los Angeles doesn't stay open as late as we do. Why is it so essential that Columbia stay open all night long? Charleston got rid of it. Greenville got rid of it. Myrtle Beach got rid of it. So anyhow, I, th I think I'm pretty safe in finishing up by asking folks uh, who support repeal of the all-night permit program, please stand. So some people said they couldn't be here because of work. I don't know if they got the message about the 6 o'clock hearing, but um, you can see we've got a lot of people who have Many of these folks have been here three times now. And so we ask you to please hear our plea for your help. Thank you. Thank you, April. Thank you. Thank you, April. Yeah, I think the microphone's on, Daniel. Um, April, I want to thank you. You and I have had some great conversations, and we've been working together. Um, unlike the human hand grenade who left a little bit ago, <laughs> um, we, we are trying to, to, to work, and I really appreciate the effort that you've shown on behalf of folks, and I just wanted you to know that, and I wanted to say it publicly because we've met and you've had an opportunity to meet Mr. Harris and understand his family and everything else. So, you know, I think there's, as, as we hope, we've been able to get through a lot of things and work together, um, and I think there's probably some compromise somewhere in there. Uh, I don't believe that there's an all-out repeal as you and I've discussed but I just I wanted to publicly acknowledge I wanted to thank you for for the efforts that you've done and and, and in the manner that we've communicated we would love to find ourselves standing shoulder to shoulder you know waving an ordinance that works for both sides the way it's currently written unfortunately does not work for our side but thank you appreciate the comments Daniel thank you all right um, mr. Michael Drennan Good afternoon, Councilman, everyone here. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this issue. I live in uh, Shandon and um, trying to figure out how to chart a course for our city that will uh, give the residents some relief without being unduly burdensome on public resources. So uh, here are my thoughts about that. I feel like in our city that we do have an issue with um, a high density of bars and a significant number of bars 
who seem to be routinely operating in disregard to our state and local laws, and this has led to adverse impacts on the security and peace of the surrounding residents and to poor health outcomes in our city. Um, I believe this has been documented by the testimony of neighbors, academic research, sled inspections, the social media posts of the bars themselves, press coverage, and also under burden of proof in a court of law. Um, neighbors are seeking relief from these adverse effects. To that end, many neighborhood associations have endorsed repeal of the extended hours permit. In Shandon, uh, the neighborhood council there has voted nine to one in favor of repeal of the extended hours permit. This is after they had conducted several discussions with residents, city council members, and bar owners who also happen to be residents of Shandon. Now, I understand that there is a counter proposal to amend rather than repeal the extended hours permit. Um, I feel like that repeal is just a better public policy solution for the following reasons. One, it has the virtue of simplicity and provides immediate relief to residents. Two, repeal does not require additional public resources, whereas the proposal for amending the ordinance will require enforcement and public resources in perpetuity and vigilance, continued vigilance on the part of neighbors. Also, to my knowledge, the existing ordinance has not been enforced. I wanted to ask briefly a question here. Recently, there was a sled infection and 11 bars were cited for serving liquor after 2 a.m. in violation of state law and the permit um, that's been issued to them. Was there any city enforcement for those recent violations due to the sled infection under the 2 a.m. ordinance? That was a clear demonstration recently. The issue's been raised. I don't think even now we're enforcing the existing ordinance. So I feel like the bars who hold these extended hours permits have not demonstrated a good faith effort to follow the law as documented by these investigations and news coverage. And I believe it's improper for the city to allow these bars the privilege of continued extended hour alcohol sales. If, however, the council decides to amend the existing ordinance, I feel like for the sake of the neighbors and the residents, there needs to be an understanding that if this amended ordinance doesn't provide substantive relief to the neighbors, we need to come back and repeal it after some period of time. Like this has got, if you amend, it's got to be the last time we try to make the 2 a.m. session work. Um, but I hope that you will support your colleague, Councilman Duvall's proposal to repeal the ordinance now. I believe it will provide relief to residents, unburden city staff and police, and preserve public resources. Thank you, Mr. John. Mr. Gottschall, Tom Gottschall. Good afternoon, uh, members of council, Mr. Mayor. I'm delighted to be here. As I've said before, I'm the neighborhood president of the University Hill neighborhood, but I speak for a lot of others as well. I do want to thank you uh, for your attention to five points. Uh, I want to thank you for turning your attention to heightened enforcement at five points under what I will say is the Rickenman plan. But I suggest to you... Um, in, in fairness, Tom, and I know Dick made the reference as well, this is a, rec a recommendation of the entire Public Safety Committee unanimously uh, to Council. So as, as you guys reference it going forward, this is a proposed ordinance, not the recommend plan. So, if it I understand that, but just as Council Member um, Duval has recommended and introduced an amendment or an amendment to repeal it, I think Mr. Rickman is the principal proponent of this thing. But I, but I take your. I know I was I was there for it. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Opting uh, the, the the problem with this proposed amendment to it is there's really nothing in it for relief for the neighborhoods of the overflow of uncivil behavior which continues unabated. That's the problem from our standpoint. And opting for the heightened uh, enforcement also requires certain things. It requires and places a greater burden on the police. The police force is understaffed. We all know that. 
the neighbors who are your constituents have had enough of this overflow and they want repeal of the ability of bars to remain open after 2 a.m. until dawn. Uh, because that has not happened, because we haven't gotten relief, we've had to turn to the courts. Thirteen were protesters for the roost. More, including the University of South Carolina, have protested for the rooftop, which is now on the agenda uh, for the court. As April said, there are 42 liquor licenses at Five Points, 23 bars, 18 of them open all at night. This status quo is not acceptable to the neighborhoods that surround Five Points. The experiment with all-night bars has failed. Charleston, which has a real hospitality business, closes its bars at 2 o'clock. Greenville does, and no city that hosts an SEC university stays open as long as Columbia, South Carolina. It is the outlier. Five points is like Bourbon Street without the charm. <laughs> what is the hospitality, what business hospitality model are we supporting here in Columbia? The Five Points business model is based on illegal activity. It serves students who are underage who have fake IDs. That's what this business model is all about. And the model has, as a consequence, changed students not only into perpetrators of crime, but of the victims of crime as well. And so I suggest when all of you who have not supported the repeal of the ordinance that permits bars to stay open at 2 a.m., at night, go to bed and lay your heads on your pillow, your heads should rest uneasily. And you should probably offer a prayer, especially Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, that when you awake in the morning, there has not been another shooting, a sexual assault, or another beating at Five Points. So your constituents have turned to the courts, and I want to read uh, just a just a quote or two from Judge Deborah uh, Brooks Durden's opinion filed earlier this month. This is what she says: "I find that Five Points is an area where underage college students congregate and loiter. Many of them have falsified." identification and are entering the bars and drinking to excess. These students and their drunken, unruly behavior become a nuisance to the surrounding neighborhoods. Of even greater concern, they are vulnerable to being victims of crime as they congregate in five points and travel back to their residence in an impaired state. Underage students, she addresses again. The presence of crowds of underage students, many armed with sham identification, an intent upon drinking in Five Points bars is an impediment, an important factor indicating that the proposed location is not suitable for that type of business which petitioner intends to operate. That was the roost. This is especially true in light of the fact that petitioner roost's business model is a bar intended to attract and serve students and young adults Proximity to a place where young people congregate and loiter has been recognized by our Court of Appeals as a factor demonstrating that a particular location is unsuitable Thank you, for the sale of beer and wine. Here the evidence demonstrates that crowds of young people gather in five points. Many become intoxicated, putting their own safety, I'm almost to the end, at risk, and disturbing the peace of nearby residents. Granting the permit and license for such a business exacerbates significant problems. And this is what's important as well. The court goes on to say that the bar is responsible not just for inside but outside. The term licensed premises, the court says, includes not only the interior but also the areas adjacent to the entrance and exit as well as the parking areas. So what's out on the sidewalk is also under their jurisdiction. 
I know a lot of you have college age or have students as children or young children who are not yet college age. Is the future of them that you look for that they will go to five points when they get of age? Is that, is that what Columbia stands for? I don't think so. We want relief. My last point is this. The proposal as now before you, which amends this ordinance, um, leaves a lot of things untouched. The bar hours remain the same. The number of bars remains the same despite the 400 foot distance required by our ordinances. The illegal business model persists and the overflow of uncivil behavior to the neighborhoods persists. More work is needed and uh, we hope it can be with you. We'd like to speak further, but we also are going to pursue our rights with the courts. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Sean McGinnis, McGrannis, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, McGinnis. That's you, Sean. Honorable Council, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. <clears throat> uh, I'm here in favor of the resolution that is before us. I just wanted to make a few comments uh, on the resolution as well as uh, the, the issue of repeal. Um, <clears throat> to start off with the repeal of the, the permits, um, all of these issues that have been brought up today and these other days, the crime, uh, you know, vandalism, sex on cars, uh, uh, the overcrowding of bars, and on and on and on. These issues are not addressed by repealing the permits. They aren't. All that's going to happen is all of those things that are already occurring will continue to occur just at a slightly earlier time. Repealing the 2 a.m. permits doesn't close down any bars, it doesn't put extra police on the streets, it doesn't uh, magically make college students not want to drink too much. All it does is hurt some businesses and put people like me, uh, I like to go out and have a beer and dinner after work, I work until 2 a.m. It's people like me kind of out of, out of place. I don't have anywhere to go, I just go from work to home to work to home. It's nice to have a place to break that up. I'm a responsible citizen, never been arrested, I don't get into, I've never had a DUI, I don't get into car accidents, any of those things. You're punishing me and you're punishing the business owners if you pursue a repeal. And I'm glad, very glad to see that that's not what's happening. Why I'm in favor of the resolution in front of us is it's, it's great because the issues that have been brought up by the neighborhood associations and the individuals from those neighborhoods are, are absolutely legitimate. I understand. I used to live next to a college. You know, <clears throat> nobody's lying about the fact that college kids drink too much. Nobody's lying about the fact that vandalism occurs when young people drink too much. Nobody's lying. I don't think anybody, there may be some exaggeration going on, but I, I, there's no reason to disbelieve, at least from my vantage point, because I've been through this. I also went through this in a city that had a 2 a.m. close. That's why I know for a fact that that's not going to make any difference. But this resolution in front of us actually does provide relief, and I like that. I think that relief does need to be given to the people who have these issues. Part of the issue, much of the issue, is what happens when underage people, people who aren't good at drinking, so to speak, have too much and then they go out into these neighborhoods and cause issues. Well, something we can do to prevent that is to not serve them at these establishments. So what the resolution that we have in front of us does is it, is it sets out stricter guidelines, stricter penalties, and strict, a, a larger attempt at avoiding that happening in the first place. Not just after 2 a.m., right? Because if you run into these issues, if you run into uh, penalties and things like that, your business is at stake, right? So uh, I, I'm just about out of time, and, and I'm not going to stand here for 10 or 20 minutes and, and uh, demand that other people concede their time to me. So I just wanted to state that I am in favor of the resolution. I'm glad that the city was able to come to a compromise that attempts to at least address the issues brought up by the neighborhoods, and those issues would not be taken, uh, would not be dealt with by a repeal.
Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Will Green. Hey, y'all. How are y'all? Hey, Will. Um, it's a pleasure to see you. Though I'm certainly not happy to be here again. Uh, once again, defending my business, my livelihood, um, from a group of people that seem to have no understanding of and no respect for our industry. Uh, to hear folks talk about the hospitality industry, it's very dismissive. It's as though we are beneath them. It's fine for folks to come to our bars, to come to our restaurants, and be served by us. But when it's time for us to go act like human beings once we're off work, well, hey, just go sit at home somewhere. Um, it frankly feels as though they decided to declare a war on our industry. And this is an industry that's given so much to this town. We can't pack up and move away. I guess we could move across the bridge, you know, but we'd lose something by it. Columbia would lose something by it. It's really ironic that we're having this meeting today because we just had a, a weekend that proves how much the hospitality industry does for this town. We just had Indie Grits come through town. And yes, we served those artists and those musicians and those filmmakers till well past two in the morning. And everybody had a good time, nobody got hurt, and things were nice and calm. We also had the Food and Wine Festival. Uh, Free Time just put that on. Massively successful. And it was amazing to see almost all of the entire hospitality industry in one room. It's an occasion that we don't really get very often, and it was just touching, to be honest, you know? And that's one of those things that you get late at night in the bars. I know it seems, you know, we're talking about these kids out at all times of night, but I'm talking about adults out. And when we are together, late at night in the bars, we get to talk to each other and catch up and trade stories and trade intel, tell stories about how to pick out the fake IDs, for example. As for the neighborhoods and community leaders, I applaud your passion, but I feel it is misplaced. I ask you to turn it where it belongs and where it can do the most good. Apply pressure to USC. I find it funny that at some of these meetings, USC has been standing on this side of the room sort of nodding along and pointing fingers and giving statistics, yet we don't hear about what they're doing to students. We've heard this number about 280 students going to the hospital last year. How many of them were underage? USC knows how old those kids are. Was there any punishment when, you, when they were caught drinking underage, when they were caught doing something illegal? Was there any punishment that came down from USC? Bars are not the problem, at least not the bars that serve adults. The children are the problem. If the neighborhoods decide to get angry at USC to throw their influence in that direction, cut off funding to the football team, uh, start punishing kids for their off-campus behavior, we'll see how quickly things change. Um, I don't want to get too anecdotal, but I was, driving, I was driving through town today, and I hit some traffic up around Blossom, and I was thinking, ah, oh, it's so much traffic, I hate it. And I realized, oh wait, in a month, this traffic will not be here. And then I thought, oh wait, in a month, the chaos in Five Points disappears for the summer. It, 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 it's significantly reduced. Why is that? Because the students went away. Their numbers significantly dropped in the summer, and there goes all that chaos. There goes all the lawn peeing, right? Now, to switch away from that, I want to focus briefly on the ordinance as written. I generally agree with it. I think that the changes the committee has made can be very effective if enforced. But it still manages to punish my bar specifically. And I've been up here several times defending the overall late night permits, but I want to talk about the way it affects us. And we believe that we are very good actors in this situation. Um, surely that can't be the intent of the law, but it is the effect. As written, we'd have to keep our, hours open for, our kitchen open for all of our extended hours. Now, we sell plenty of food, but there isn't much call for it after the time that we already have established. To sort of put in a little plug, that's midnight most days of the week, Friday and Saturday, that's one o'clock. Now, if we had a demand for that after that time, we would certainly keep it open and sell more food, but we don't. Also, the nature of late night business is sometimes we stay open until one, sometimes we stay open until four. It's, it's a very difficult ask for us to keep a kitchen guy on staff keep our, our ovens up and running, keep our fryers up and running for three, four hours when somebody may or may not sell another thing in that whole time. So we would just ask that you consider changing the, the language to a total percentage of food sales rather than when the food sales cut off. That would be very helpful for us. 
Um, I thank you again for your time and patience. I hope that it's a long time before I have to see you again, but I hope you will please come visit us and see exactly the kind of business that we are and the kind of model business that bar none and nightcaps are as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Lynn Shirley. Mr. Mayor, council members, I'm Lynn Shirley from the Hollywood Rose Hill neighborhood. I don't have any uh, written remarks, which is probably a good thing, but I did want to start with a quote that it just occurred to me as I heard the other speakers. Um, you may know the name uh, Martin Niemöller. His famous quote was, first they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then it ends up, then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak up for, because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up. I live a block and a half from Rosewood Drive. I am marginally affected by the things in Five Points, our, if I want to be flippant, our once a year drunk co-ed that passes out on someone else's front porch is as much as we hear. We just hear the traffic coming and going. But it appears to me my, my background is in geography, and the comments I've made to some of the core people on the issue of repeal are that it is a density problem. There are too many bars that attract too many kids that stay open too late. And if you didn't have that density, you would, am you would ameliorate those issues somewhat, right? And that's the whole 400 feet, how can you have this many bars in it? I also question that if business is so good, why so many specials for drink specials have to be given out for kids that tells me that the market is saturated in five points and that through some factor, whether it's um, denying permits as bars change ownership or whatever, that you do need to look at how many bars there are that stay open regardless of the hours. I do agree with the last speaker that the hours may not be the problem. The problem is consumption of alcohol and the type of clientele that consume it, right? Ours is one way to potentially control that, and we can argue. So those are my primary points. As a property owner and someone who understands property values, you know, this is a business licenses and money it generates versus people that choose to live nearby. I'll leave you with this one. I was contacted by friends of mine who lived in Columbia on South Saluda with me 15 years ago. They now live in Charlotte. Their associate pastor at a good United Methodist Church is coming to Columbia to be a faculty member at Lutheran Seminary. And my neighbor said, hey, Lynn, would you give this woman some idea of neighborhoods that might be good? She enjoys living in a city, in the city. And she had already discovered that the AC flora and the drear zones was where she wanted to be. The other thing her realtor, whose name I didn't know, told her is you don't want to be too close to five points. I'm afraid a lot of these good people back here live too close to five points for comfort for that. So... Those are my thoughts. I appreciate your time and also appreciate what a difficult issue this is, as are most things that you, that you deliberate. Thank you. Thank you, you Mr. Early. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Douglas Carlisle. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Councilman, uh, long suffering that y'all are at this issue. Uh, elected officials often have to endure such scenes, so I appreciate your listening. I am a professional economist for the state, but I'm not speaking for the state today, but I am going to address something that is dear to many economists' hearts, hidden costs. There is a hidden cost to be paid for the current situation. There's a hidden cost in all the USC police enforcement actions. There's a hidden cost in Columbia police enforcement actions and ambulance costs and so forth. Moreover, there's a wider damage. There's a wider damage because of businesses foregone. I knew a businessman who 10 years ago thought the situation was getting out of hand and moved. He said, things are just crazy. I have to work late and I'm afraid to go outside. There is a, a cost to be paid for people who would not be patronizing those businesses. There's a cost to be paid in the future, potentially from civil suits that have to be paid by bar owners. There's a cost that's paid by the people and individuals who suffer violence. A 
policeman said, they're people who look like students, they act like students, they dress like students, but they're not the predators, predators own students. There is a cost for Columbia. Just before I came here, I mentioned, I said, you know, uh, I con have a concern about the Five Points situation. And immediately before I could finish, one person said, I don't go to Five Points. I never go there. The second one said, oh yeah, I went through there at two in the morning. I was, I was afraid. One white, one black. There is a cost for real estate. Our property value is going to decline. We don't know what they would have been had these situations not have occurred. And finally, there's a cost being paid by some of the people defending it because, in fact, they have a cutthroat bad business model, many of them, that involves really a very core group of students going down there and they're competing among each other for them and there's just simply not enough business to go around. So there are all these hidden costs and we're all bearing them and even some of the people who don't want repeal are so I urge, if you can, repeal it. If you can't, something stronger than what's before you, and certainly enforcement. I appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Ms. Anna Edwards. You have to walk too fast. Walking time doesn't count against your three yeah, minutes. I just want to get up here and move along. <laughs> Appreciate the opportunity to speak before you all. I'm Anna Edwards um, from the University of South Carolina. And um, we spoke at an earlier hearing and um, obviously play a, a role in this very important issue and want to continue to, to represent the university and our role in our community. USC is committing to being a part of the solution by educating our students and holding them accountable off campus. But we ask and we need to work together to create healthier and safer environments for those who choose to enjoy our entertainment districts. Five Points is the location where the vast majority of our students uh, or the vast majority of extended hours permits have been granted. It's an environment where inexperienced under, underage students can walk into most bars and drink until the wee hours of the morning. We're opposed to the current draft of the ordinance because we don't believe that it substantially impacts the current practice of targeting underage and overly intoxicated students. The university, again, is committed to holding students accountable for creating a nuisance in the neighborhoods. In 2015, we implemented an off-campus incident reporting form and system which allows local neighbors to report nuisance properties or behavior concerns off campus. To date, we've received 263 reports, and once these reports are received, a staff member meets with the students, the local neighbor, and other parties to reach resolution. There's also work with code enforcement, zoning officials, the Office of Student Conduct, and law enforcement to address the issue. We have a mechanism for receiving off-campus reports from law enforcement in the entertainment districts when a student has been cited. Thus far this year, there have been 345 reports related to alcohol and drug citations from off-campus that we work with local law enforcement in receiving. When students are sanctioned, there are fines. These fines have increased in the last three to five years from $25 to $250 to $350 per sanction. Conduct probation, which means that if there's a violation of that probation, the student risks suspension. Parental notification, they call their parent to say, hey, this is what's happened. And educational workshops and programs. The university implemented a three-strike policy several years ago, which is a national model for uh, college campuses, and we have received, we've seen recidiv recidivism decline at the university. Uh, without question, Five Points is a wonderful attraction to greater Columbia community, and we're committed to working with city leaders, business owners, and community members to find practical solutions to impact the problem associated with underage and high-risk drinking in our, in our community. However, allowing bars and clubs to continue to promote late night and early morning drinking as a primary activity with little regard to identity, 
Enforcement and other existing legal ordinances places undue burden on law enforcement and diminishes the quality of life for nearby residents. And I do have um, a, just a, a letter um, to each of you that um, you can get after the meeting asking for further conversation and maybe a broader presentation to the council on the efforts the university is doing to educate students. Who's the letter from, Anna? From myself. Okay. With the endorsement of our president and the university administration. All right, thank you. Yeah, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think you might have a couple of questions, Anna. Well, the university may have some questions, or uh, Reverend McDonald. Yes. Let me just ask. I think it's important for me to to say that, um, and I guess the question that I have is, why did it take so long for us to come <laughs> to this point? And everybody owning up to their responsibility. Why did it take so long? I know that I've been involved in this conversation for about seven years and most actively in the last three. And um, I think we're um, driving a, a, a large ship and you know we're committed to um, representing the university and the community and uh, making sure that our students are active citizens and they represent the university, their families and, and this community to um, the best of their ability. We can't control every behavior that our students make, but um, we know that we're, we're a player in this. Mm -hmm. um, I can't speak to uh, the length of time. I know that um, in the Department of Student Life and the Division of Student Affairs, this is what we do. We recruit students, we um, encourage uh, students to come to the University of South Carolina for the academic experience and also the, the community that's built here that many of you participated in as students. Um, we also can't control every hour of every day, but we provide education and we provide the structure that um, hopefully encourages positive decision making and holds them accountable when, when that doesn't happen. I guess my concern is, is that the community is taking on the university's responsibility in terms of managing what has taken place in Five Points. Um, and that's it ought to be collaborative, and I'm not sensing a real collaboration until all of what has happened has happened in five points. Uh, the community stands, but the community can't do it by, by themselves. There has to be some collaborative, something collaborative has to take place with the university. And has that conversation been a part of what the community ingest and digest. Uh, it has not been a part of that conversation and um, I feel a little torn because of that. Yeah, and there are you know, great partnerships with our neighborhood associations. We meet regularly with them. Um, we have a community uh, campus coalition that many Tom Gottschall, I think, is one of the founding members of that town gown type of relationship. So um, recognize that maybe the public uh, display of our support and collaboration has not been as present as it is currently. Um, but you know, we work alongside our community members um, and community officials, city officials. I did have one question, and I, I, I tried not to attend too many of the meetings as we try to avoid quorum. Uh, the, um, help me understand the policy decision behind moving students to five points, mm -hmm. but not bringing students back. The shuttle, uh, the current USC shuttle or, is- Or maybe the, or the hours, I should say. The, the hours? hours are, um, that is not in my unit, um, but the hours are 10 p.m. until 3 a.m. And the goal is to get students into five points for any um, entertainment activities. Regardless of age. Yes, okay. regardless of age. And there are pickups throughout the campus perimeter, so it's not just an on-campus delivery from a residence hall to five points. Um, and that shuttle has reduced crime in the area. I mean, I think um, Chief Holbrook probably shared at an earlier council uh, meeting about the, the reduction in the aggravated assaults and some of the robberies along the Green Street corridor. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Ms. 
Devine, and if Mr. Rickman has a question. Um, so going back to the, some of the statistics that we've heard a lot, um, the, the number of, of students who went to the hospital, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what the university does when those incidents happen? Yeah, so when a student is hospitalized, um, they go through a it's brief motivational interview, and it's a public health um, process where students meet three times with a trained coach uh, to go through the decision-making uh, factors that led them to get to that point. So is it their drinking? Um, is it other factors related to their status as a student that are impacting their excessive drinking that leads to um, hospitalization? Because you know, typically students um, who are hospitalized for alcohol are drinking um, liquor. We've not had a student yet who has been transported for drinking beer. Um, and so many times there are underlying issues that students are dealing with that lead to their um, excessive use of alcohol. And so we work with the students on a, um, a plan to get them back on track so that they can be successful as a student um, and receive counseling. Sometimes it's um, a situation where a student needs to take a time out from the university. Their behavior and their um, alcohol drug use is such that they can't be successful in that environment right now. And out of those numbers, do you I guess, do you guys segregate which ones are? Because I would imagine the majority of university students. I mean, I didn't turn 21 until I was a senior, right. so the majority are underage. Right. So majority. out of that number, um, is there any difference in the fact that they're underage drinking? And are there any stiffer penalties? I mean, I think certainly taking a time out from the university is pretty stiff. But outside of that, are there other things that um, go to to help more um, uh, prevent slash penalize the behavior so that not just for that student, but so that other students recognize that the university takes that very seriously. Yeah, so typically if a student is underage, um, there could be a citation that they have received from law enforcement, which that will compound their, their sanction or their outcome um, with the Office of Student Conduct. Um, we don't publicize the number of students or the names of students who have come through this program. Um, we have a federal law that requires or prevents us from doing that. Um, but there is, um, you know, word travels pretty quickly uh, for students. And once students, you know, the three strike rule that was implemented a couple years ago um, has really, uh, you know, I think had somewhat of an impact because we were seeing um, few students come back through the system so that you don't have to suspend students for their behavior. They get back on track and they're doing what they came here to do. Ms. Edwards, I, I, I wanted to follow up because one of the things that's been in this discussion is we've talked about numbers, but we, the university has, has talked a lot about what they've done for the students. But one of the missing pieces is, is the university has made a pretty clear stance that, you know, they want bars to, to be regulated. They want certain things from the bars, but the university's not doing the same thing with its venues. Colonial Center, last night, young lady in front of me got two beers at the Eagles concert, which was fabulous, by the way. Um, nobody ever asked her for an ID. I couldn't tell you if she was 21 or not. Yeah. She was a lot younger than the average age there because the average age was mine and older. Um, but same at football. We encourage tailgating. It's the only place in Columbia that you can walk around and drink and the enforcement is not there. So what I would ask is we move forward that what you're asking other people to do, that you do the same thing. Because I do, I do think it's a little hypocritical to put the pressure on one group when your own venues don't do the same thing. And I've had that conversation with the university and I just I wanted to make it a point because it is something, if we're talking about an overall underage drinking, then everybody's got to be on board. Absolutely. But, you know, I also believe that this, this thing didn't start seven years ago. We all know that there were no permits required. Everybody was allowed to drink. What we have is a concentration. Some people say it's bars. Some people say it's students. Mm -hmm. But the one conversation that we haven't had as a group is, when do we hold the individual who makes the crime mm -hmm. accountable? The problems that the neighbors are having, they can, it can be a bar, but what about the pre-gaming? Mm -hmm. 
What about the grocery stores? What about the convenience stores? What about the people who are selling it to these kids? And as we went through the statistics, as you and I talked about, a lot of these drinking issues and hospitalizations were before 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, but if a kid gets caught at the university, they have a choice. They can get arrested or they can go to the hospital. We had two yeah. students stand yeah. up here and, and tell us that, so okay. I don't know if yeah. that's true or not. But so as we look at those numbers, but I would ask is that we continue, is that we have better dialogue together to work. You know, um, there's some of us, and I think there's probably a lot of universities would agree that 18 for beer and wine would solve a lot of headaches because people won't be trying to have their last drink before they leave, not knowing they can have another drink later. Mm -hmm. I do think the, the, the campus activities that aren't there also you know, create an atmosphere where you we're pushing kids to to the entertainment. Unlike Georgia, North Carolina, or other places where fraternities and other places can have on campus where they stay on campus. So whatever we can do to work together, we want to. Yeah. Well, and I think that's why we're here. We want to be a part of the solution. And regardless of what happens with the ordinance repeal, not um, we're not going away. And we want to be a part of the solution. So we look forward to further conversations and work. Ms. Edwards, it'd be helpful. I, again, some of us weren't part of the committee, so we didn't hear those things. And you, you might have someone testify to one thing, as we have even heard today, and there's yeah. background to, behind the statistics. But can you, verify, can you find out for us and verify whether or not that's true regarding if a student is caught excessive drinking on campus, if, there's a, if there is a choice between the hospital or uh, jail because that would certainly play into the numbers that keep getting cited of the number of kids that go to the hospital so that would be inter interesting information for us secondly I, I forgot to ask this regarding those numbers and I asked that before and I didn't get an answer I didn't get it's being recorded as well so you can go back and look at it in channel 2 Erica can shoot ad, no ad nauseum yeah. <laughs> But um, I didn't get an answer. Um, well, I think the answer I got was that there wasn't any for any information. But regarding the, the students that get cited, um, if there's any information regarding where they had been mm -hmm. drinking, because I, I think that that plays uh, a role in the bigger conversation for us as a, as a community. I mean, there will be a decision one way or the other regarding the 2 a.m., but there is a bigger conversation that we need to have regarding underage drinking enforcement and making sure that the students that call Columbia home for this period of time are safe. And if we know where these things are happening, we can address that. Yeah, absolutely. In my letter, I, I offer a kind of overview of our prevention and education efforts and all the details related to um, what we do from, you know, point of a student being admitted to graduation in terms of this topic and um, responsible decision making and some of the highlights that you cover. So. Ms. Devine, I'll make sure you get copies of this that came. This was the second draft Ms. Edwards provided to us that had the footnotes so that you could follow and see what the real percentages were and how they work. But I'll make sure you get copies. And I look, and I look forward to, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Duval, please. Off campus? Yes, sir. The, um, I think the 345, what? Yes, I can get that for you. Okay. Making sure that wasn't our off campus nuisance reports. What was, um, Mr. Davis, please? I'm sorry. Everyone's got a question. Uh, please. Just, just, just one question. Uh, the students are the focal point right. in terms of. Um, wanting the best for them and mm -hmm. protect them and allow them to be able to enjoy the, the atmosphere and surrounding areas of campus. And I'm, I'm hearing that um, there are some, or there have been some uh, education mm -hmm. um, initiatives in terms of getting students to kind of understand impact and that sort of thing. What kind of feedback do you get from, from the students and what and the things that you, you're trying and the things that you've tried? Mm -hmm. So we do an online alcohol education and I can give some of you a broader um, 
overview of this one day, hopefully very soon, but where we require all incoming students to take an online assessment. Um, as you can imagine, that is not their favorite activity prior to enrolling at the University of South Carolina, but it gives us a really uh, great perspective as to what their familiarity is with alcohol, what their drinking behaviors are prior to coming to campus, and then they take another assessment after 45 days on campus where we see the impact of this environment on those students and their drinking behaviors. We do a number of educational outreaches and special populations like Mr. Rickman noted, uh, fraternity and sorority life, where we know that that's a, a population of our student body that attracts a more high-risk student. Um, so we do work with the, the students that coordinate tailgates and we provide education um, to them on the laws, the expectations, and being a member of the Carolina, Carolina community, this is what we do. Um, as you know, that um, you know, sometimes students are um, interested in receiving that information and sometimes it has to be re reinforced in other settings after there is an incident or they have a situation on their residence hall floor uh, with a friend that um, you know, gets into trouble or has a, an evening that they don't want to repeat. Um, and that's when students come back to us wanting the reinforcement, wanting um, wanting us to, again, go over some of the things that will help them be successful. Um, we, we reinforce a lot. You know, students, we don't do what we do because students enjoy hearing uh, the information or, or they, uh, they like it. Frankly, we do it because we know it keeps them safe, it keeps them healthy, and it makes them a vibrant member of this community and, um, you know, so they can go, go out and represent us all one day. I look forward to reviewing the letter and follow up conversations yeah. with you and uh, uh, Dennis and uh, Dr. Bastides and, and whoever else. Um, I've always been somewhat circumspect when I speak at the, about the university. Everything I think I've been able to do in life, I uh, owe to uh, the grace of God, some awesome parents, and the education I've received at the University of South Carolina. Um, I have a lot of questions uh, about some of the policies. Some obviously may seem practical, mm -hmm. um, but if in fact, uh, we are gravely concerned about underage drinking. I'm not sure why we would transport underage students mm -hmm. to Five Points. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about some of the policies and practices that lead into that. Do we mm -hmm. check students for sobriety before they get on the bus? Uh, do we, do we um, uh, when we track this data as to who's been admitted to the hospital, do we see if those are some of the same students we took down there and, and brought back and, and the connectivity of these issues and obviously the larger public health and, and, mm -hmm. and mental health issues that, you, that, that you're uh, mm -hmm. attempting to address there. Um, some of the challenges that we see are, I don't believe, are unique to Five Points or any other uh, district like that or, around the country. But Five Points has been Five Points for a number of years. We've seen rather explosive growth mm -hmm. at the university, which is good, I believe, for Columbia and good for opportunity. Um, but some of the spillover effects are having, you know, an effect in the neighborhood. So I just, I'd, I'd be curious to dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. into, and obviously, I, I know moving students there and back is a public safety issue, and want to make right. sure that if so, it, so is there an internal acknowledgement that the students are going anyway? So we'd rather transport them than not transport them. And if we transport them, then what is the responsibility at the at, at, at the, uh, uh, the the public corporation as the university? attached to that uh, and, and right. just some deeper questions and, I, and they may not be referenced in the, in the current letter but as we continue to discuss I'd, I'd love to dig a little bit a little bit deeper um, uh, into that if in fact this, this uh, ordinance was repealed the permits were repealed would the shuttles then stop I mean uh, they go to 3 a.m. I mean uh, would that continue and just 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 want to right. dig a little yeah. dig a little bit deeper yeah. and realize that 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 we are indeed um, interdependent. Mm -hmm. and, um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the shuttle started after Martha Childress was shot in 2011. So that, um, that was a safety um, initiative that was implemented due to the the crowds there. So absolutely mm -hmm. all valid sure. questions and I look forward to further conversation. Well, thank you so much. I know you're you. uh, there a lot longer than you expected to be, so I appreciate it. Oh no, thanks. Um, Beth Richardson, I'll see Beth. Oh, there she is. Hey, Beth. Congratulations on partnership. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. 
Uh, good afternoon. I thank you all for holding uh, this special meeting to address, you know, what is obviously a very complex issue for which, admittedly, I think we all recognize there's no ace in the hole here. And we are really looking at um, uh, an issue in which there are going to be many approaches to resolve it overall, and it's going to take time. Uh, that being said, I, to me, um, you know, I have not been at it, I will um, step back and say, I have not been at every committee meeting. I do not profess to be as well educated as you all are on it. But uh, it seems to me is I still can't understand why the repeal of the 2 a.m. ordinance is really a big deal. Um, for some of you who don't know me, my name is Beth Richardson, and I moved to the city of Columbia in 2001. I moved into the old Shandon neighborhood near Lower Waverly, and I now live in the University Hill neighborhood. I have been very active in my community. I've used you know, Martin Luther King Park, where my three children, who are now 11, 10, and 8, grew up playing in. I uh, go to Five Points, not so much with my children, but with my husband for dinner. We enjoy the walking aspect of our neighborhood, but I will not, um, I, I hate to admit, uh, because I love to uh, tout the beauty of these historic neighborhoods around Five Points, but uh, it is embarrassing the way in which the neighbor, the Five Points is kept on Friday morning, Saturday morning, and Sunday morning oftentimes. I also am embarrassed that I have to see this man on my runs at 5.30 in the morning picking up all the trash everywhere and that my taxpayer dollars are going to that effort. Why do I have to pick up for the bars not picking up after themselves who are open that late? Um, I just don't know what we gain by this new middle ground. What research have we done to say that this new middle ground is the best resolution for the city of Columbia, the capital city, when we have examples of Charleston, Greenville, and Myrtle Beach who have clearly passed this ordinance with no ado to their cities? Do uh, this whole concept that we're losing out on hospitality by not allowing the bars to operate after 2 a.m., I think, is, you know, misguided. Sean Brock, Mike Latta, the owner of Husk and Fig, they haven't, you know, left Charleston, who has, you know, repealed the 2 a.m. ordinance. And I just really encourage you all, just from the most simple, you know, approach that, we do not make a big deal about the 2 a.m. repeal. And we just can't, I recognize that it's one necessary step to a very complex problem. I, I know my time is up, but I also want to talk just one, very briefly that USC, I recognize, needs, needs to have a deep conversation with the city and how to work with the city to tackle this problem. But they have been for the last three years, very involved in the neighborhood association efforts and responsive to our complaints about problems within our neighborhoods. Um, so I did want to mention that. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much, Beth. Um, Sue Darn. Good afternoon. I wasn't planning on speaking, but it dawned on me uh, when I was driving over this afternoon, that this feels familiar. It reminds me of um, when we were trying to ban smoking in bars years ago. There was a fear that bars would lose business and um, it ended up being resolved, um, as I was talking to Councilman Davis about earlier, it ended up being decided that it became a matter of public health. It seems like this also has become a matter of public health and public safety and um, I hope that um, better. Thank you. Thank you. Let the record reflect Ms. Doran did not yield her time to anyone else. Okay, so don't, <laughs> don't plan to use it. Um, is it Martin, is it Dreesen? Uh, 
How are you guys doing? Uh, can't really add a lot to that. Um, some of us have really good business models. Um, Barnon's been in business for 23 years. Um, as a late night bar serving food till 4.30 in the morning. And we've done an excellent job. I think we're an asset to the city. Um, thank you guys for letting us do that. Um, a lot of things I don't disagree. I disagree with what they said, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, just I hope you give me the chance to keep on running my business the way I have. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm sorry. Can I ask some questions? Because I, yeah. I, I don't go no, <laughs> after fine. two. So I just want to know logistically, um, these are some of the questions I've had reading this. So. Um, you mentioned about the food. You currently at Bar None do serve food um, until? 23 years ago we started and we, um, the whole idea was to get the service industry after they got off work. So we serve food till 4.30 in the morning. Okay. Um, sales, food sales have gone up. It's probably getting close to 30% of our sales. So between 2 and 4.30 or whatever, what percentage of your revenue are drinks and what, what's rev um, revenue um, is food? I would food? say between 2 and 4. 430 is probably 50 50, very much so. Um, most of our clientele aren't students. Um, most of the students we get, they come there after other bars close and get cheddar cheese fries and glasses of water. You know, um, <laughs> so, um, we have a good clientele, and we don't, you know, we don't cater to college students. I really don't want them in there because I don't want them tearing up my bathrooms and getting sick. You know, um, there's a lot of responsible people out there, and we've run, you know, been there 23 years. Um, only had an A from DHEC, never had a workman's comp claim, never had an unemployment claim, never had a ticket from CPD until recently, the SLED thing, but that, there's still due process of law. Those, you know, I don't think anybody's paid those tickets yet. Um, you know, had a lot of employees go on to become, you know, to have careers in architecture, banking, officers in the military. You know, people forget about the employees that are working. I only see us, you know, in, you know, not all bars are created equal. We don't have the same business plan. You know, I don't cater to students. Other bars do. You know, I don't know how you guys deal with that, but, um, you know, I think I have a good business plan, and I think my record shows it, just as nightcaps and the wig, and, you know, some of us, you know, we go for an older clientele, and we do serve food. Thank you. I, I hope I get to continue, continue doing it. Did you have another question? Uh, didn't expect all this, did you? All right, please, Mr. Just McDonald. stand there until everybody's done. When we don't say anything, it's time to sit down. <laughs> um, I heard you say there has not been any, any incidences at bar none. Um, I would, you know, when you say... And when I say incidences, I'm just, let's just say occurrences. I would say there's not a bar in the world that doesn't have an incident. That doesn't have inc I would say there's not a bar in the world that doesn't have incidences where there's an altercation between customers or something like that, you know. Um, but none of them are significant enough, you know, um, where we don't call the police department. I think you could probably ask the officers down in Five Points, and they would um, speak highly of how we run our place and how we take care of things. So bar none is... Um is an older crowd. Yes, I would say so, yeah. You know, and, um, we're open for happy hour too. Our happy hour is, is an older crowd. I'd say average age is probably 40. Um, okay. You know, um, running the bar is tough. It's probably, you know, you're responsible for everybody in your bar and you're responsible for them when they leave, you know, and if I'd have known I was responsible for the university and the neighborhoods, I'd pay myself more. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> It's a tough business. My parents had a bar for 31 years, and my dad uh, said he wouldn't wish the bar business on his worst enemy. Um, you know, but I like it. I like people, so I hope you let me continue to do it. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, good. Thank you, Thank Mr. Jason. Um, Walter Marks. Chief, thank you for the job you do. Uh, Councilman, one question I'd like to ask for you being the President of Wells Garden Homeowner Association, long before you were on council, a member of many committees at USC. Um, I feel like they've been very committed in the last years to help the neighborhoods. I also serves at the university on the University Associates, which is a conglomerate of 
business leaders in the community. Um, one problem that I personally had, but not with this council, was working with council. And that would be a la the landlord or to say. If it hadn't been for Mr. Davis and my missing councilman and Tamika, we'd still be out in the neighborhoods trying to get city to come uh, do ordinances. Um, unfortunately, councilman, I do agree, but I won't use his same methods of um, debt. I think this is the same old same that I've heard before. Um, I won't go into a lot of rhetoric again about the old one didn't work. We know it didn't work. I worked in Momador five years ago on that ordinance. Nobody's to blame. But the one thing that we can blame is that we didn't enforce it. And that's what I think is wrong with this one, that where are we going to enforce it? What I think is I'm not here to um, go against the bars or hospitality. I think we all enjoy going out at night and clubbing. Um, I think we're looking at something much deeper. I'm not here to pick on the university because they're an 800-pound gorilla. It's easy for a councilman to pick on them because that just deflects the real point here today in my mind. The thing that I think that this is a bureaucratic attempt to change something that hasn't been given enough thought. So I'm not here saying get rid of 2 a.m. So maybe there's a better way. I know we have a great chief. I know we have great councilmen, and I know we have civic leaders that should be involved before we get up in the morning and read the paper and say, well, maybe we can have staggered closings. I know Mo Medora and I talked about this constantly of putting all these kids on the street at when this came up the first time. I get that. What I don't get is saying that the university has a responsibility to do certain things, but I don't hear that the Constitution of South Carolina did not give bar owners, not all bar owners, I'm only talking about the questionable ones here today. I know they're good bar owners. I've been to them. I've been to Mr. Rickman's restaurant numerous times. And I'm sorry it went out of business because it's one of the best. But they didn't give these bar owners the right, no constitutional right, to put, set up a bar wherever they want to and serve alcohol to who they want to at any age, at any time of night. Now, the one difference is I work for a public corporation and we handle very sensitive material. And we are liable, just like Facebook was, to get, to, um, get that information on the street before it's time. That bar owner, when he picked up that license, agreed to obey state and local laws. Clearly, there's no councilman here today to say that there are a few questionable bars that are not doing it. And I don't think that the ordinance that came back to this or whatever you folks want to call it from your legal terms, clearly addresses all those issues. And we have some good councilmen here that have not looked at this totally yet. One would be to make accent. She's, she's terrific. She's represented my neighborhood. I remember her coming to my neighborhood with a little kid in her. And I know the mayor. And I don't think the mayor spent enough time on this either. And I think that this council needs to slow down and decide what's going to be a good thing for the city of Columbia that represents the neighbors. There's nothing in this new one that takes care of the neighbors. And I don't want to say the neighborhoods don't take care of me as a citizen. And I think that'd be the responsibility of this council to make sure when that comes that it represents the citizens of the city of Columbia. And I would ask anybody that's in this room tonight to stand up in, if they live in, in the area around the university or if they don't stand up because we're the ones living with these problems. And thanks to council with the landlord ordinances, things have gotten better. Thanks we hired a good chief in Columbia, things got a lot better. I feel safer for sure. I think we have a good council. But I'm asking this council to, to this is clearly a case of a little bit of the tail wagging the dog. And you know, you're gonna be on the wrong side of history if you represent a very small portion of bad bars. And five points, whatever you want to say about it, it's giving this town a bad reputation. I get calls from all over the place, wanting to know about five points. And I say, you know, I feel safe down there. But this is a clear case that you can, I wouldn't want to be on this council and make a wrong decision. And I'm asking y'all to, in your heart, think about slowing this train down and figuring out what you're going to say to the city. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I just Question. want to add one comment, Absolutely. and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, debate but I would ask you to read this ordinance because the same person who helped you with the landlord ordinance 
help put this together. And it does have teeth and it addresses a lot of issues. It's not perfect yet, but we're not done yet either. But I would ask you to have what you've asked us and to I've do. I, I, would, I would ask you to do the same thing, is so. ask those folks to also come to the table because I think it's a two-way street. And, and, and I'm going to say it again because Miss Lucas has made grounds that other people have not because she hasn't been sitting throwing hand grenades and everything else at everybody. She's actually tried to work for a solution. And so I would just say, please read it because it does. It, to say it's lipstick on a pig or whatever Dick likes to throw out in his, his typical rant and raves, this, this thing actually does make a difference. And it, is it perfect? No. Are we willing to listen? Yes, but let's, let's, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because these people who are sitting here, Mr. Driesen, Mr. Harris and his wife and his family, these other folks who've been running legitimate businesses for 20 plus years deserve the right to run their business legitimately. And I don't think any of us would like us to go and change your business model and tell you you can't run your business the way you did it. Now, do we need to enforce and, and do things? I believe we have teeth, but at the same time, I also believe that the bad actors, they're not in this room today. If you look around, they're the ones not here today, and they haven't been here the whole time. And I believe that we have ability to do that, but I just, I just ask you to please look at it before you say it, it's just lipstick. Well, sir, since you don't know much about my career, I, I'm known for that. I was an artillery and the officer of the Army, so that would start that. Uh, if you'd have listened to my opening statement, I agree, they're good bars. I'm not picking on these people today. What I'm picking on is this bureaucratic piece that came out of council. And, uh, and council says, y'all all saw it. Uh, you know, it just looks like lipstick to me. So I, I'll call it what I want to. Well, but Skip, thank what, you for your what I would add on that, though, honestly, um, and because you indicated about slowing down, yeah. to be real honest and all due respect to my colleague, you know, Mr. Jabal presented a, a ordinance that no one had seen yet for us to talk about and potentially vote on before we had this discussion. I agree. So when you talk about going through and slowing down, this process has slowed down because we've had an opportunity to, and I say we, I have not been part of that, but we've had, the, count, the, the council committee has had an opportunity to go through this and bring forward a recommendation. The rest of us are getting into this, you know, for the first time in the weeds. And as I've shared with April and others, I think it, it's our job to have these public hearings, exactly. to hear comments so that we can look at this and ask the right questions and maybe tweak it to make it better. Um, but that's part of the process. I mean, that is our democratic process. And I, I think it's unfair um, to present an ordinance to, to that may potentially affect someone's business without going through our due diligence. Absolutely, and I agree wholeheartedly, and I'm glad to finally get to council because I feel like I'm better represented today than I was at the committee here. Um, and we, and we, we, Howard wasn't this, disagree this, with what I said. And this, is, <laughs> this is what we're going to do. Um, unless you have a question for, for, for Skip, or we're, we're going to, um, if, if a question him, you ask him directly, otherwise, um, We'll let you have a seat, and, and if you have comments, we can make some comments. Point of order. Point of order. Point of order. You, 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 the, 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 I, lady, the, lady, the lady from Earlwood addressed you directly. You want a chance to respond? I, I, I would like to have a moment of, of correction of the uh, misspoken uh, way this thing came about. Um, I did not ask for a vote on this ordinance when I proposed it. I proposed an ordinance that was help, I had the help from Mike Hamlet writing it up, and I asked that it be referred to the proper committee, which was the Public Safety Committee, for its review and to report back to council. I did not ask the council to vote on it without hearing about it. That's the way public policy is made. You have an, something that you think is a good public policy, you present it to the proper legislative body, which was the city council, and its subcommittee, the Public Safety Committee. They have studied this thing ad infinitum, and now they are reporting it back. We're going to study it a little bit more. I've got some correcting amendments I would like to offer at the proper time, maybe tonight or, or during the interim period that Mr. Uh, Rickman has talked about. But I have not rushed this thing. I want it studied. I want it repealed. And, and uh, I think we had handled it properly. Thank Amen. Thank you, Mr. Duval. Well, I'm going to agree to disagree on that. But. <laughs> 
Well, it, it actually initially on the first agenda, it appeared as an ordinance to be presented. I think after discussion, it was referred to a committee. Um, and then we got to this process, which is fine. I mean, we need to get it to the process to have discussed, but that's, that's, that's how it was. Howard, I had meetings with people who were asking me to vote for it when you had it on the agenda. Again, so I, just be honest. Uh, am I going to have to grab the gavel? No, no, Mr. No, I'm, um, I'm done. I'm Mr. Done. Davis. Uh, well, um, appreciate your comment. Yes, um, sir, I've you. also talked with, with April, and uh, I'm uh, of the opinion of Daniel that uh, she is um, just kind of looked at this thing and sort of tossed it around, put it in the oven, brought it back out, and, and it's kind of um, hoping that, that we could, um, at the end of the day, come to a meeting of the minds on what is best, what is the best approach to get the product that we want. Sure. Um, and I, I'm hearing you say the same thing, and knowing how you are, I would want to ask you, um, when, you know, to, well, I guess to further define, slow down, what would you do that we haven't done? I'm not, hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but if you want to do that moving forward, that would be helpful because I'm hearing you say that there's something we could have done, would have done differently, and that would be short of uh, just leaving it as is or short of, of um, going for total ban. I think that's what I'm looking for from you. And, that's, and, I, and, that's, and, and that's, I think you're capable of doing that. Well, that's a good thing. And, and Walter, Walter, thank you for all the leadership you've done in the, neighbor, in the various neighborhood associations citywide. Um, but that's, that's why we have this process, y'all. So this is a public hearing. Uh, we'll share ideas. We, we've heard some, some good things, some, some, some um, helpful things, some not so helpful things. And, and uh, we'll continue the process of policy making between now and however we choose to act prospectively. So if you got some more stuff, uh, just as, as, as we've received from um, Ms. Lucas and others, let's keep it coming. Let's keep it coming. And, and to answer your question, um, you know, I don't disagree with Councilman Rickman. I, I, when he was on council the first time, he probably doesn't remember that I knew that, but um, I thought he had great ideas. I'm not saying that he's wrong. I don't want to hurt good people either. I think what we're looking at is a situation of a few individuals that are operating businesses that are outside state and local laws. And I think that, unfortunately, um, that also hurts good people. Now, I think there should be a way with this council, as smart as you are and as much brain power as I shouldn't wake up in the paper and say, well, maybe we'll have staggered closings. Maybe we'll do that. That sounds like a brain trust that you folks get together with the chief and say, hey, which of these can we really enforce? to protect the, the citizens against people that want to break the law. I'm, I know there's many people in this room that don't, and I think that's what I've seen lacking, especially from that committee. And I came to all the hearings. But today, as, as I know I came today because I knew I would see the full council, and I've, I know the leadership y'all give Columbia. So I'm just asking for some more of that, and I'm glad that it's back before all of y'all to think about this. But again, Openly, thank y'all for all you do for the city and my time today. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for the marks. Um, April, did John leave? Okay, all right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and the last uh, person signed up is Jim Daniel. Jim. Members of council, I'll be quick. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Wheeler Hill Neighborhood Association. I'm their president. At our meeting in January, we voted to support the coalition's request to terminate the after hours uh, permits. But there's one other thing that we learned during the recent ALJ case, uh, and it's not applicable to all of these bar establishments. That particular bar said that during their peak season school year, they could generate as much as $20,000 a week in revenue. So multiply that by 52, you see a seven figure figure. Uh, when y'all, if you, when you look at what's been proposed, you might want to look at a different kind of way of a, uh, establishing a fee for these establishments. When you, a, a sliding scale based on how much business you have. When, you, when I file my business license, my, what I pay for my business license is predicated on the income I've had the year before. So maybe it would be fairer 
when you determine what the fee should be, the little guy pays less because he's smaller, the big guy pays more because he's bigger. So if you're generating a million dollars a year in income, you pay at a certain figure. If you're generating $150,000 a year, you're generating a different figure. So thank you. Jim, I, I just you, you mentioned that to me in an email, and, and, and if they were generating $20,000 every week, our business license folks will be going to collect a check from them because uh, I, I, agree. I don't think they've been claiming that. So uh. that, that was a sworn testimony from these guys, and that question was asked over and over again, and it was answered over and over again during our peak seasons. We can generate $20,000 a month. So, I mean. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir, yeah. Mr. McDowell. Are we done? Yeah, thank, thank you, Jim. We are done, Mr. McDowell. That was the last um, person who signed up for the 330 just, public uh, hearing. Just a moment of personal privilege. And uh, of course, I uh, want to thank each of you for being here today and exercising your right to come to this podium uh, and speak your piece. Some weeks ago, and, and I must, I got to say this. Um, Daniel Rickerman has taken some hits that he doesn't deserve. Uh, this is not Daniel Rickerman's ordinance. ordinance. Uh, Sam Davis and I worked on this. All of us worked on this together. There has been some tremendous hits on both sides of the field. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair. Um, it's our fiduciary responsibility. What we wanted to do was to initially is to have a public, public uh, hearing, to sit down and after gathering all of the information to put that in written form. Not anything that was going to be concretized with anything, but of course, given opportunities to tweak the document. So I've had a very uh, ravenous here, here. I've heard everything. I think it's to our, it's to our, it, it, our ability as a city and as a community is to move forward and to hear what folk has to say and to say without consequence. We can speak passionately, but we don't have to tear each other down. One of the good things about this council that you will find nowhere else in any city is that we can disagree with each other and not get mad at each other. And I think that's a plus for this council. So in, in, in closing, uh, I think it's necessary that we not slam each other that we speak our passion and that allow us, I think, uh, Skip, you said it a few minutes ago, allow us, it's not bureaucratic in, in, in notion, but allow us to get all of the information and then determine in a very collaborative way where the road is going to lead. So I thank you all very much for allowing us to hear your concerns. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. McDowell. And um, second public hearing is scheduled for what time? 6 p.m., so when we get to it on the agenda. Uh, so Groundhog Day is at 6 p.m., y'all. And um, uh, but I don't think there's any need for everyone to be here again unless you, 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 for the public hearing portion. Uh, but um, thank you all for uh, sharing with us. I think we're going to have a moment to be recessed between now and, 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 and six. All right. So yeah. thank you all so much. Executive session. Executive session. Oh, uh, executive session. I'm sorry. Um, madam, madam, so, uh, who has a motion? I wouldn't move. Can you hear me, Erica? Can you hear me, Erica? Okay. Go ahead. I would move.
Motion, motion for executive session for receipt of legal advice relating to a pending, threatening, or potential claim. Amanda Creel Godfrey versus City of Columbia, Odom versus City, Cumberland versus City, Cricket Store versus City, and Resolution 2018-032, City versus Hotel Guides. Discussion of matters relating proposed location expansion of services to encourage the location expansions of industries and other businesses regarding rain living and the discussion of negotiations incident to proposed purchase of property at a stoke court. Good to see you, Skip. Yes, sir. Second. Mr. Rickman. Mr. Rickman. McDowell. Rickman. Um, uh, Mr. Duvall. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Mayor Benjamin. Thank you. Aye.